I saw the purchasing order on the table when you were asleep, Nightingale swallowed the last piece of bread, and then casually asked, what do you plan to do with so much ice? It's winter. If you want to drink frozen ale you only need to put it outside the house, so why would you buy extra ice? The upper nobility like to use ice in the summer, they used it together with saltpeter to enjoy cooled milk, fruit juice, or wine. Since now was the time of the cold season, the price for the acquisition of saltpeter was very low. To make iced cheese, the current temperature isn't low enough, answered Roland. Although the woman in front of him wasn't an enemy, he could not tell her everything like he did to Anna. The steam engine was something different, but things like firearms didn't require such a high level of technological understanding. Once spread out, their distribution could no longer be controlled. As long as he didn't know what kind of a person she was, it would be better to keep some things a secret from her. When he thought till here, he said imploringly to Nightingale, does the Witch Cooperation Association not only search for the Holy Mountain but also train witches as assassins? No, they just swarm together in order to find the cure to end their pitiful life, Nightingale waved her hand dismissively, I joined the Witch Cooperation Association, but that was only two years ago. In other words, you were working for someone else before. Her excellent knife throwing skills were a product of years of hard training and good instruction, so Roland could confirm that, so apart from me, there are also other people who are willing to shelter witches. Shelter. Nightingale's face became a little strange, how could? If he had known that I was a witch, he wouldn't even let me through his door. I'm afraid he would have killed me in secret if I had stayed with him after exposing it to him. Oh, can you tell me more? Nightingale smiled and shook her head, but this time the smile contained many unknown emotions, your highness, you have to wait until the time is right before I tell you. I know what you are anxious about, but please rest assured. Five years ago I got my freedom, and now I no longer need to work for anyone else. His verification test failed, it seemed that his charm points were not high enough, ah. But her answers confirmed at least one of his presumptions, at least five years ago, she was a person who was involved in some shady business. Fortunately it seemed that teaching and using Nightingale was apparently a coincidence, and her former employer was not like himself, who intended to employ a large number of witches. Roland did not pursue this point any further as he bent over his drawing to finish it instead. After some time he was a little bit surprised that the usually talkative Nightingale had now become quiet, and the only sound in the room was that of the fire burning. By the time Roland raised his head to stretch his sore neck, he could not detect any sign of her in the office. To walk out without saying anything, he muttered, as he folded the parchment in his hands and put it into his personal pocket. The next days he was busy with drawing the weapons designs or testing the already finished designs. His intention was to make the famous flintlock firearm. This kind of weapon was already tested through history, the difficulty was to make a gun similar to an arquebus. First the gunpowder had to be inserted and then the lead ball was to be loaded. The firing rate was close to 3 rounds per minute, so it really didn't require much skill in order to deal with the demonic beasts. Most of the demonic beasts couldn't climb the walls, so the shooting distance was approximately equal to the height of the walls, which was 12 feet. At this distance, even with a bad aim it should be possible to hit the beasts, and the lead ball would also not lose much of its power. If only the skin of the demonic beasts evolved to be as hard as steel, then they could be easily shot and killed. The disadvantage laid in the production time of a flintlock. It started with the matchlock, the smith had to slowly hammer it into form from the barrel to the trigger. The entire production of a gun would take about three months, wherein the barrel needed the largest part of it. First it had to be beaten into a thin and cylindrical shape, and then the spiral grooves could be engraved. Although without the right equipment it was quite sophisticated, but it should still be possible for a well-learned blacksmith to make a good barrel. This was also one of the reason that Roland created the steam engine first. With the steam engine, he could use a steel drill to bore the drill directly into the solid iron, so with this the production speed could significantly be increased. He didn't need a master blacksmith to do the work, he only needed one table on which he could affix the barrel. Chapter 28, Fierce Scar When Roland tried to change the theory into practice, he discovered that it wasn't as easy as he imagined. In the backyard after four or five days, the production of a harder drill was successful. It was easily quiet since he could use the high temperature flame from Anna, which could easily get above 1500 degrees, and was enough to melt iron. Without needing to think about temperature control, 
and using the conventional method of producing steel, it was easy and quickly possible to make a small quantity of steel bars, namely the high-speed stirring of iron clubs with molten iron. The excess carbon and other impurities in the pig iron would oxidize when coming into contact with the air. By repeating this several times before letting the molten iron cool down, it was possible to get high-quality steel. The problem laid within the steam engine. The worked-up noise and vibration by his prototype of the steam engine was very impressive, even when stabilizing the drill it was impossible to complete a pipe. When doing heavy work or menial jobs, this degree of tremor didn't matter, but processing a gun barrel was clearly not possible. If he wanted to improve the steam engine, he would have to create a centrifugal mechanics governor to control the output power of the steam engine, and then he could reduce the tremor by using gears to adjust the rotation speed of the drill. And he need a simple lathe machining gear. With all this in mind, Roland simply found no way to achieve this goal while preparing for the coming months of the demons. In the end, he could only use the old-fashioned way, and let a blacksmith hammer the drill into the barrel. But the plan to mass-produce firearms was impossible. According to the number of smithies in Border Town, it was only possible to produce three to four root barrels each month, but only in the case that he stopped the production of the second steam engine. The only good news was that didn't have to worry about the quality of the barrels. The blacksmith only had to knock out a rough pipe, and then Anna could do the unifying commissure. Her work was seamless and so good that it basically eliminated the risk of a barrel explosion. So Roland had no choice but to change his former plan. He had intended to recruit hunters from Border Town, who would then form a rifle team, most of them were proficient in archery with either a bow or crossbow, both were handy weapons. In addition, they only need a short amount of time to train with the firearms, so they could be quickly sent into combat. But now with only four guns produced before the months of the demons, he could only pick the most outstanding hunters and had no manpower to build up an elite group. Roland decided to let Iron Axe handle this matter, he already spent 15 years in Border Town, so he should know who the best hunters are. For the last month, Brian was unhappy, especially when he met the militia in the street, his unsatisfied feeling would be doubled. He even felt a trace of loathing. He felt his highness had forgotten him. A month ago when he was called by the chief knight, he was full of excitement. He would have close contact with the fourth prince, and get orders directly from his royal highness, how fortunate and glorious would that be? He grew up in Border Town, and although he born from a common hunting family, by virtue of his ability he was able to get a place as town patrol. He knew he could not rely on his family background to become a knight, but instead could only wait for the opportunity to get enough merits to receive the honor of becoming a knight. His highness asked him what he knew about the demonic beasts, so he was apparently unwilling to give up his own territory during the winter. He was trying to find ways to fight the demonic beasts. Later the wantonly built walls also proved that there was no doubt that this year they would spend the months of the demons in Border Town. If he wanted to stop the invasion of the demonic beasts here, we would have to set up a front-fighting team. Brian thought that he himself was a good candidate, he was proficient in investigating, fencing, and riding, and in the last year he was even the last person in Border Town who ignited the flames, proving that he did not lack courage, but he had never expected that his highness intended to elect a team from the civilian population to fight against the demonic beasts. Yes, a purely civilian team, and not just him, but the entire patrol team of 10 people were not accepted during the review by the chief knight. This was simply incredible, did his highness think that these people, who had never held a sword, would be better at fighting than his own town patrol? He was afraid that when they got to see the evil beast's fierce appearance they would instantly collapse. But his highness seemed to be serious. He not only trained the mob, but even gave them a uniform and many other clothes. Every afternoon Brian could see this group of people dressed up in a brown and grey leather armor, they were arranged in two columns running down the street. In the beginning, they were lacking any order, but recently they had become neater and neater. While he himself still had to perform his boring task every day, he couldn't see any possibility of promotion now. When he was tossing and turning at night, he could hear a sound at his door, then the door opened and someone came in quietly. Hey, we are up, whispered a person in a low voice. Brian could tell to whom this voice belonged, it belonged to member of his own patrol, nicknamed Fierce Scar. In his room slept five people. In addition to himself and Greyhound, the other three quickly stood up, and they seemed well prepared, they hadn't even taken off their coats. Captain, get up, 
I have something important to tell you. In Longsong stronghold Fierce Scar had a noble relative, who had not heard of his great noble uncle. So thanks to this he had a high status within the team. It was not good for Brian to ignore him, so he had to climb up and ask, what happened? Greyhound also woke up, this is, it's so late, why don't you sleep, aren't you sleepy? I have the greatest job in your lives to introduce to you, you want to be canonized as a knight, right? What, what, knight? Greyhound was surprised. Brian Hart jumped wildly and he quickly asked, in the end what is the job? You all know my uncle Hillerer, he isn't only the herald of Duke Ryan, even more, he is one of his confidants. This is news he himself personally confessed to me, Fierce Scar spoke with a low voice, the fourth prince preparing to shake off the shackles from Longsong stronghold made Duke Ryan very unhappy. He has decided to let the prince know who the true owner of the western border is. Difficult, difficult, don't, your plan, assassination, Greyhound was so nervous he even begun to stammer, and he didn't even speak a complete sentence. How would that be possible? Fierce Scar laughed maniacally, after all, he is a prince, if we kill him, not even Duke Ryan could shelter us. I said this is your biggest chance in your life. Brain felt subconsciously that the deal was certainly not as simple as he claimed it to be, but the temptation to be canonized as a knight was too great, he could not help himself and opened his mouth, begin to talk, we are listening. Food? If he has no food, he can only humble himself and go back to Longsong stronghold where Duke Ryan already promised him a place. As long as we can successfully burn the food, which the fourth prince had previously bought, Duke Ryan will organize the canonization ceremony for us, and will give each of us fiefdom east of Longsong stronghold. This is a golden opportunity, Captain, what do you think? Why you are crazy, now, hadn't his royal highness astrologer said that this year, months of the demons would likely hold on for more than four months, if we set the food on fire, if we burn it all, what would we eat? Greyhound again and again shook his head, two, two years ago, there was a great famine, has everyone forgotten it? What does it have to do with us, asked another person disdainfully, anyway, I do not intend to stay here, if we do the job for Duke Ryan, we can live a comfortable life in the stronghold. Yes, do you want to eat this hell of slag for a lifetime, do you? Other people begun to chime in. Hell, they already colluded at an earlier time. Brian's heart became cold, and in addition, except Greyhound most of them were from outside of Border Town, they came from all over the kingdom and they don't have any nostalgia with this town. Feeling powerless to stop them, Brian had to change the subject, but the purchased wheat was transferred to his royal highness castle, and all the doors are guarded by his highness knights, how could you go through with your plan? That's why I need your help, fierce Scar smiled proudly, from an early age you have stayed in this broken place, so no one is more familiar with the environment here than you. I remember that you once said that there is a ravine in an abandoned well, and its end is connected with the castle's water supply. Through it, we can silently enter the castle garden. Didn't you find it when you were still a child? How is it? With this easy task, you can become a knight in the future, a knight personally canonized by Duke Ryan. A knight should not do any injustice, instead, he should have the courage to fight against it and he should not be afraid of any danger, and should always be ready to protect the weak. For Duke Ryan's personal gains, the residents of his hometown would face the threat of hunger and death. Becoming a knight like this, there was no glory at all. He refused to open his mouth, but Greyhound began to shout. You are a group of maniacs. You, you're, actually thinking about the idea of burning the food? I would never, never let you leave this place. I will report it, report to, AHH. Greyhound only spoke until here, his voice suddenly became weaker, with an incredible look he turned around, looking at a former teammate standing behind him and sneering at him. A black dagger was inserted in Greyhound's waist, the dagger was totally inserted into the body. Greyhound shivered twice, he opened his mouth and tried to say something, but he could only emit a hoarse breathing sound. The other guard stirred his dagger twice, and then he abruptly withdrew it. Greyhound, like a doll who suddenly lost its support, softly crumbled to the ground. How? Fierce Scar was suddenly so close to Brian, that the latter could even feel the foul breath exhaled from his mouth, I think you have made a decision, right, Captain Brian? Chapter 29, Fury. The castle in Border Town hadn't always stood in the place it stood now, when they laid the foundation for the first castle, the ground collapsed due to an underground cave. Because of this, 
the castle position had been moved. The already excavated sewers were mostly destroyed in the collapse, and some parts were still intact, but these parts were also discarded because of the relocation and redevelopment of the castle. When Brian was still young, he often played in these underground tunnels, and one day he accidentally found a route from an abandoned well outside the castle wall that directly lead to a well in the castle garden. Brian told the news of this discovery to his father, but he got a severely beating in return. His father also warned him that trespassing into the Lord's castle was a capital offense, in the case that he was found it could only end with a journey to the gallows. Through this Brian was frightened for his life and never went into the old sewers again. However, when people get together they will start to drink and chat, and during such occasions he had repeatedly boasted about his own ability to have direct access to the castle. Now he was extremely regretting it. The entire town's patrol apart from Greyhound were nine men. In other words, Fierce Scar had convinced the entire town's patrol, and they were now working for Duke Ryan, who was in control of the western part of the kingdom. Furthermore, the rewards were so good, that presumably only very few people could withstand this temptation. The abandoned well was in the part of the place which collapsed in the beginning, and it was still a wasteland even today. Fierce Scar ordered Brian with his sword to lead the way, and during the whole time on their way to the well Brian was caught in the middle of the group. The fairly spacious waterways he could remember from his childhood had now become very narrow. Because nobody went through this way, the water diversion had dug many holes in which have grown many vines. The guy who stabbed Greyhound was leading the way at the forefront and holding a torch, in the other hand he held a hatchet to clear the way of all obstacles. While Brian pretended to recall the road, in the bottom of his heart, he secretly thought on a way to escape. But for such actions this was clearly a very inconvenient place, here he had no possibility of escaping. Only in the castle, there was the possible to obtain a slim chance. But how should he do it? Should he cry out loud to lead his highness guards to them? No, no that was a bad idea, Fierce Scar only had to raise his hand and he would be able to take Brian's own life, he had to get away from him, otherwise his fate would be like that of Greyhound. When thinking about Greyhound, Brian's eyes became somewhat gloomy. Before Border Town had been established, he and Brian himself were already living here. They grew up and played many times together, and even joined the town's patrol together, which was Brian's idea. Greyhound had never expected that he himself would be elected as captain of the patrol. Brian had been happy for him for a long time, but because of his stuttering, Greyhound had suffered much contempt. But today, he finally had the chance to be recognized, at last an opportunity arrived, thought Brian. But when Greyhound went down and Fierce Scar snarled towards Brian, Fierce Scar sarcastically told him directly to his face the true reason why everyone elected Greyhound as captain. Fool, he was elected because an important job of the captain is to stay behind during the months of the demons and take care of things, like igniting the flames to ring the alarm. We let you do this, because why should I do such a dangerous task? This sentence was like a sharp knife, directly stabbing into Brian's ear. So those who modestly declined when they got the offer for promotion. Those congratulations words were so false, their true reason was so ugly. He showed a look of shock and despair across his face, to cover up the raging anger within his heart. This was simply inexcusable, Brian secretly raged, someone must pay the price for this? After walking for half an hour through the dried sewer, the crowd finally could hear the sound of flowing water. This meant that they weren't far away from their destination. After they turned around a corner, the front was suddenly a lot more open and bright, the open place could accommodate two people standing side by side. The person moving in front of the group said, there is no road ahead, it's the mouth of the shaft. What now? asked Fierce Scar while poking Brain with the sword. Tell him to look up, Brian narrated, we have finally arrived. This abandoned channel was just in the middle of the castle sewer. At the time of the repairs, maybe due to negligence, they didn't seal this interface. Fierce Scar stuck close to the wall and took a probing look, at his feet the rushing water was three feet deep, and when he looked upwards he was able to see the night sky through a small hole. He let the other people to look at Brian, and he took his backpack and pulled out a bundle of rope, fastened a hook to it and gently tossed it up, only to hear the sound of the hook firmly sticking to edge of the wellhead. Fierce Scar followed the rope, cautiously climbing out. Soon, he tugged at the rope from above and the other people schematically went up. After a long wait, it was finally Brian's turn to climb up the well. Originally they could only see the cast far into the distance but now stood right in front of them. 
Fierce Scar grabbed Brian and ordered silently, you're coming with us to the warehouse. Brian had only been here once, although in his memory the look of the castle had become blurred, he still knew where they were, if they forced open the nearest door to the well, they would directly enter the castle. At this time most of the people in the castle had already gone to sleep, and the oil lamp hanging at the wall of the corridor had already been extinguished, too. In the darkness, someone had to light a fire. The weak fire illuminated only a radius of a few feet, but Brian was waiting for his chance, which would certainly come. When the team came to a fork in the road leading to the basement, he aimed for the stairway leading downwards, and suddenly rushed past his guards. The guards at Brian's side were caught off guard, despite paying attention to every movement he did, Brian just jumped too fast, so they had not a chance to respond, but soon they reacted and jumped down after him. He fell down the stairs, out of the range of the light and disappeared into the darkness. Oh shit, damn it. Fierce Scar immediately pulled out his dagger and jumped down to to catch up. He thought that Brian would take advantage of the darkness and would play hide and seek with him, so he was caught off guard when Brian didn't escape. He instead stood patiently at the end of the stairs as if he was waiting for him. Fierce Scar noted that his other accomplices were already lying motionless on the ground, and in Brian's hands were the men's weapon. Idiot, do you think you have a chance of winning against me? Fierce Scar took on an alert posture, and he could also hear his other men coming down the steps, we have seven people, and you are alone. Brian did not answer, it was already needless to constrain his own fury any longer. He brought up his sword and quickly slashed diagonally downwards, hitting Fierce Scar's sword, instantly creating sparks. Before Fierce Scar could even take his next defense posture, Brian's sword tip had already pierced his shoulder, Fierce Scar gave off a pained roar, and took a step back to let another man step forward, blocking Brian's pursuit. This was an excellent place for Brian to fight, with narrow aisles his opponents could simply not take advantage of their superior numbers. He just stood in the center of the corridor and had only the enemies in front of him. He would be able to hold off two people, who had to fight with their swords side by side. In fencing, Brian would not lose confidence against anyone in the patrol. When these group of lazy scumbags were gambling and indulging in a bar, he was still honing his combat skills, regardless of wind, frost, rain, and snow, unbroken through the whole years, this was his choice and the reason why he didn't shout for help immediately. He wanted to personally avenge Greyhound. Chapter 30, Out of the Fog The substitute for Fierce Scar came forward to merely receive two fast attacks from Brian before getting his sword swept away. They were not much of a town patrol, it would be more correct to call them a group of bullies. Thinking this fueled Brian's anger even more. In addition to extortion and blackmail, what else did these people do? Greyhound and Brian had carried out the tasks given by the Lord without any loose threads, but the ranks beneath them were a completely different category. But, it was this group of trash, who would be the group taking refuge in the stronghold. This scum, the scourge of the two who even dared to kill Greyhound by employing an extremely despicable method. This was unforgivable. His sword slashed towards his frightened opponent and cut his neck off, but just in this moment, a shadow which stuck behind his former target's back attacked Brian's heart in the blink of an eye. The blow was too subtle, so when Brian noticed it, it was already too late to parry. In a desperate act, he violently threw himself backwards to the ground, and at the same time while he was falling backwards, he felt a stabbing pain in his chest region. After two rolls backwards, he immediately stood up again and took a defensive posture. Brian was lucky that the sneak attack just now had only pierced his coat and skin, and didn't cause any heavy injury. The key was to stab at a man's weak point with the sword. From the impression he had of his own patrol members, he was sure that none of them had fencing skills. Huh? You actually escaped, the man kicked the lost weapons of his dead teammates away, and step by step came forward towards Brian. What the hell? Brian found himself unable to recognize the other one, he was not a tall man, but his hands were too big in comparison to his body, when his arms were hanging down from his sides his hands almost reached his knees, his eyes were so strange, Brian could swear that he had never seen this pair of eyes. You are not a member of the town patrol. Who the hell are you? Although five of the ten members from the town patrol were living next door and he rarely dealt with them, he could still always recognize these people. So this guy obviously replaced one of them and followed the team on their way into the castle. The fact that he didn't previously see him on their way into the castle was not surprising, after all, the night was pitch black. However, 
there was no reaction from the group of Fierce Scar. Since they regarded him without surprise, there was only one possibility, this guy was previously arranged for by Fierce Scar. You can guess the answer. Why do you need to ask me, he replied while smiling indifferently, anyway, you are going to die soon. Damn, he hurt me. Fierce Scar bitterly flamed, Viper, quickly chop off his hands and feet, I want to slowly bathe in his blood. Unfortunately, Mr. Hill, I must give priority to the completion of the task given to me by my lord. Just like his name, this guy was really the incarnation of a serpent. He would always attack from a strange and tricky angle, in addition to his extremely long arm span. He directly forced Brian into a bitter struggle. Brian was forced back again and again, and he could never find an opportunity to counter-attack. He was just too careless. In his heart, Brian could feel some anxiety welling up. He had already fought so long in this underground walkway, so the guards above should have already noticed the fight, right? He had originally intended to personally avenge Greyhound, but now he could only hope to live a little bit longer, waiting for the night guards of his highness to come break the siege of these villains. You seem to be waiting for something. Viper suddenly suspended his attacks, I guess you're waiting for the prince's knights to come rescue you? Unfortunately, this stone castle is differently built from the common pubs and brothels. It's only a matter of time before those wooden shacks break down. But this door here, even if you tear out your throat while shouting, the people behind would never hear any sound. When Brain heard the reason, he could not help himself and hesitated for a moment. This was exactly the opportunity Viper had been waiting for. He slashed with his sword downwards, pressing Brian's sword down, and paralyzing him in his movements, then he slightly raised his other hand and triggered the hidden hand crossbow in his sleeve. A one finger long bolt shot from the cuff, and when Brian heard the humming sound of the mechanism, the bolt had already pierced into his lungs. Suddenly an unbearable pain exploded within his chest. Brian threw his sword in Viper's direction and then turned back and ran. However, his pulmonary blood was seeping quickly into his trachea and made it difficult for him to breathe. He really couldn't run far. He tripped over a threshold, took some staggering steps and fell heavily to the ground. Viper soon caught up, he wanted to end this fight quickly, but was held back by Fierce Scar. Let me do it, hissed Fierce Scar through his gritted teeth, I want to kill this guy, after all, he stabbed me. A cold look flashed through Viper's eyes, but in the end, he still stepped aside, but do it fast, and do not forget that we still have other business down here. Fierce Scar grabbed Brian's hair and growled at him, believe me, you will die slowly and very painfully. Brian wanted to spit into Fierce Scar's face, but his body strength flowed away like water into a bottomless hole. He did not know how much longer he could live on. The regrets of his life came into his mind, such as not yet meeting his wife and not fulfilling his dream to become a knight. But what he regretted the most was, that he didn't avenge Greyhound. Wait, what was that? He blinked once and suddenly there was a woman sitting on the lid of a box, although within this dark light, he couldn't see her appearance clearly, but with such an exquisite body there was no doubt that she was a woman. Hell, was this an illusion? It has to be. He fell into this room at midnight, and there was definitely not anyone inside. Could it be that God in heaven had heard his complaints and specially made this fantasy to comfort him? Hey, you're playing so lively in someone else's place and even intend to kill someone in front of my face. I'm afraid this isn't appropriate right. Fierce Scar saw something flickering at the edge of his view, so he abruptly let go of Brian's hair. He took his sword out of its scabbard and turned to her while hearing that several other members of his team were doing the same, who are you? Why would they too respond to her? Wait, with his dim consciousness Brian begun to think, what if when what he was seeing wasn't an illusion? Of course, I'm here, the woman jumped from the box, bent over and patted the dust off her gown. In the dim firelight, Brian could see strange patterns embroidered on her robe, three juxtaposed triangles, and set in the center was a huge eye. The contour of the eye, when illuminated by the fire seemed a bit golden. Why are you here? Sneaking through the sewers like rats. Her voice was clear and sweet but her face showed no emotions. This was an anomaly. Anyone seeing such a murder scene shouldn't be so calm. Viper was aware of this point. He looked solemn as he slowly turned around to face the new opponent and suddenly attacked with a piercing strike. The woman didn't look concerned as she casually waved her hand. But Viper didn't even see her arms moving, he only felt a cold wind blowing through his body. Seeing such an unbelievable sight, Fierce Scar could only stare in disbelief. 
He rushed forward to help Viper, but he could see that he came too late for Viper because the place where his arm normally was, was already empty. Along with his falling arm and sword, Viper dropped to the ground. Seeing this, Fierce Scar was overwhelmed by fright and could feel a strangling pressure in his throat. Others did not know, but he knew very well the ins and outs of Viper. Vicious, cunning, and very dangerous. This was his uncle's evaluation of Viper. He could recruit other people, he held absolute strength, and should never be underestimated. It was even difficult for Brian to hold off Viper's attacks for half a quarter of an hour. But now, he had been casually blown away by a woman, and even got his whole arm cut off. Everyone don't stupidly stand around. Go and kill her, shouted Viper while pressing on his wounds. Due to his excessive bleeding, Brian's vision began to blur. He could only hear chaotic footsteps, sounds from weapons clashing, as well as the sound of bodies hitting the ground everywhere around him. Then, everything became muffled. In the end, what happened? He tried to turn his head, and looked in the direction of the fight, what he saw then was a picture which was too difficult to understand. The woman was just like a ghost, walking in and out of the crowd however she wanted, vanishing out of sight again and again. Every one of her attacks would penetrate the enemy's vitals. It wasn't possible to call it a fight, it would be better to say she was dancing. He had never seen anyone able to wield murderous weapons while having such a sense of rhythm, slaying high and low, drawing an inconceivable path. In contrast, the people around her were nothing more than a group of clumsy clowns. They tried to fight back, only to fall in vain. In the end, only she was left standing, proud and independent. That was the last scene he saw before he lost his consciousness. Chapter 31, Our Friend. Roland was sitting at his desk in a dazed state. He actually didn't expect that someone was trying to commit murder in his castle. He was afraid that if Nightingale hadn't promptly discovered them, they would have murdered him in cold blood. Who ordered this assassination attempt? Was it his third sister, or one of his other siblings? Why were they doing this? It was a five-year struggle for the throne, but in the past few months they had already tried to kill him twice. Roland, full of irritation, banged his desk. This was simply outrageous. Couldn't they just let him face the months of the demons? Footsteps could be heard from outside of the door. It was Carter, his chief knight. After he pushed open the door he said, Your Highness, the identities of the deceased have been identified. From the eight bodies, Seven were original members of the patrol, but the last one is still unidentified. In addition, there are two who are still alive and under the care of the witch, if not. After being treated by Miss Payne, they have yet to wake up. Also, the path to the sewers is being closely guarded now. They were from the town patrol? He knew that the team raised by the former lord wasn't reliable. Roland gritted his teeth, actually, eight from the ten people were disloyal, so not letting them join the militia was really the right choice. That is good, and also make sure they are always well guarded, don't let them commit suicide like the last time. Like, the last time. Oh, nothing. Roland shook his head. Apparently due to Nightingale's early wake up call, his head was still confused. Anyway, I want to know everything about them. Who is their leader? Who is their contact person? Who is their investor? You must investigate all of this and more. Yes, your highness. Carter had gotten his orders, but he did not leave immediately, instead he went down on one knee and said, that the assassins could sneak into the castle was my dereliction of duty. I hope your highness will punish me. Enough is enough. At that time, you weren't even in the castle, so this has nothing to do with you. Well, Carter hesitated, can you tell me who it was in the end that prevented this assassination attempt? I could see from the scene, that they, the knight had to swallow, all of them seemed to be have been killed by the same person and were totally defenseless that you can tell. Roland was curious. If they were evenly matched, the scene wouldn't be so clean and the wounds would be in a wide range all over the bodies, Carter whispered, everybody was killed down in the small warehouse, in addition to blood and dead bodies there was nothing else on the ground. There was almost no damage to the goods placed down there. Those big boxes which store bacon didn't even have a sword cut. That shows that the man didn't need to use any cover, it seems as if he was taking a walk in a small clearing. With all due respect, your highness, this is just too incredible. So that's the reason, Roland nodded his head, he understood the meaning of Carter's explanation. After a theoretically strong person was surrounded, he would fall into an extreme adverse situation, 
Real fights usually didn't end like what was shown in movies, where the surrounded person sends one enemy after the other towards the ground. An attack from a blind spot would be particularly deadly. So to fight many, the correct approach would be to rely on the terrain and the environment so that they could always face the opposition. But Nightingale was not one of those ordinary people. No matter what you do, you have to complete the mission I gave you, first. This person cannot be revealed yet, but when the time comes, I'll tell you. Although he knew that the Chief Knight was one of his loyal and reliable subordinates and that he also knew that Nana and Anna were witches, but Roland still chose to hide the presence of Nightingale from him, because the difference between her and the other two witches was that she didn't belong to their side. She only stayed in Border Town because of Anna. She belonged to the Witch Association Cooperation, and would sooner or later leave this town. Carter gave a salute and retired. Roland could understand his thoughts. As a person well versed with the sword, Carter constantly practiced a training program that was produced from summarizing and accumulating fighting techniques for hundreds of years, and in truth they were proud of their heritages. But when he saw the scene in the warehouse, he couldn't believe it and began to have doubts, if swordplay could be perfected to such a state, of which heritage were they normally so proud of. I thought you would tell me to come out, Nightingale revealed herself. She was still sitting on the corner of his desk, with crossed legs. I also thought about it. How about it? You can just settle down here as my hidden sword. You will get two gold royals as monthly salary, the double of what Anna gets. What do you think? Roland began to advise it further you will get a house with a garden, two days off each week, and even paid leave every year, ah, uh, that's it, the rest would only be a monetary reward. To his surprise, Nightingale didn't flatly refuse him. She only smiled and said neither yes or no, I cannot abandon my companions, no matter what. That would be now, but when the winter is over, Border Town will begin a time of reconstruction. And at that time, how many people will still care about it? And then, the witches will no longer have to suffer discrimination while walking in the streets. No one will see you as the devil's spokesperson. And so on. You are always talking about it, said Nightingale indifferently. It was time to stop. It was always better to see than to hear. This kind of thing could only be changed slowly. Roland changed the subject, Nana has been safely sent back, right? Ah yes, but she got spooked. Roland sighed, it couldn't be helped, after all, it was midnight when she had been woken up by Nightingale. When she was brought to the scene and saw the battle place, she almost threw up. Nightingale gave him a short account about the things which happened, and then he told her to get Nana. Usually, Nana had to only heal chickens. But now, when the little girl saw people covered in blood, she immediately fainted. After a short while, she woke up and began to heal the person from the town patrol with her face full of tears. In order to keep Nana's family in the dark, Nightingale was also responsible for taking her back. When everything was settled, it was almost daybreak. How was the investigation? Could you figure out which of my good brothers or sisters sent them? Nightingale shook her head, they were all people of your own patrol, with only one exception, but he also didn't carry any identity-related evidence with him. With enough money, anyone could hire them, but I think that this perhaps isn't related to your siblings. Why? Because it was extremely unorganized. During multiple occasions, the team actually had a lot in fighting. And immediately after their failure they didn't commit suicide, leaving at least two people alive. And then, they had no professional performance. In general, they were just street punks. This is unlike the style of your brothers and sisters, it is more likely that it was a layman's plan. I think that even if I wasn't here there was no way their assassination attempt would have succeeded. Don't forget that Anna is sleeping downstairs. Nightingale reached for Roland's cup, she didn't seem to care about drinking from the same cup as him, and then said, no matter what, your knight had asked for the truth of what happened in the sewers, and I bet he will soon know the truth, compared with the former piece of your sister, that guy is much less professional. If I hadn't left, he would still kneel before me begging me to not to kill him. That seriously injured patrol member, it seems that he is the one I summoned not too long ago, really. Nightingale tilted her head, I think that you'll have to reward him. If he hadn't stood up against the other guys, I would not have found them so quickly and they would have slipped into the basement of the castle. Although it is still not clear why he did that, but the enemy's enemy is our friend, right? Yes, Roland thought, but the important part was not if he is a friend or foe, but rather that Nightingale said the two words. Our friend. 
Chapter 32, Night When Brian woke up, the first thing that caught his eyes was the white ceiling. The sunlight shining through the window was somewhat bright, so he had to close his eyes a little. Then when his eyes got used to the sunlight, he opened them again, only to find the scene in front of him unchanged. Feeling that it wasn't a dream, he thought, I'm, still alive? He tried to move his body, but soon noticed that he could only lift his fingers a little bit. It seemed that his whole body's strength was gone. Then he heard someone shouting, he woke up, go and inform his highness. His highness? Brian felt like his brain was filled with paste and that his thought process was many times slower than usual. By the way, what happened after I fainted? I can only remember that viper pierced my chest and that I was dying, and in my last moment I could see a ghostly woman who defeated all the enemies in an incredible way. Soon a maid arrived to help him up so that he could sit in the bed. Then another maid came holding a basin and sat down next to him and immediately began to help him clean his face. In his whole life Brian had never experienced such comprehensive personal service, plus the maids were all young women, which made the situation really awkward for him. Fortunately, the situation did not last long. As soon as the fourth prince entered the room, everyone else left. Brian could feel a surging heat within his heart. He had too much to ask, but then, when he tried to open his mouth he didn't know from where to begin. But contrary to what he had expected, Roland nodded and said, I already know of all your past achievements, and Brian, you are worthy of the title of a hero. Hearing the word hero, Brian suddenly felt his eyes begin to tear up. He began to sob and his voice choked, No, your highness, my friend, is the real. Roland patted him on his shoulder so as to comfort him. It was exactly like Nightingale had predicted. After Fierce Scar was dragged into the torture chamber, he began to tell everything he knew before the warden even put his hands on him. The one behind this group was not his sister or any other of his siblings, but Longsong Stronghold's elk family. Count Elk got in contact with his distant relative Hiller Dimitri. Afterwards, Fierce Scar gained control over most of the town patrol with the lure of a reward. In addition, he also sent an assassin to replace one of the members in the team to prevent an accident from occurring in the course of action. The purpose of this group of people was not to assassinate Roland like he had thought, instead they intended to burn the food reserves so that he would obediently go back to the stronghold. Their conspiracy resulted in the death of an innocent person, Greyhound. He tried to stop Fierce Scar when he heard of his criminal intent, but he was stabbed to death with a dagger by one of his own subordinates. The whereabouts of the patrol member who was replaced by Viper was unknown. When he didn't see fire on the castle ground and noticed that Fierce Scar failed to come back, he probably realized that the plan was discovered and fled. To help stabilize Brian's mood, Roland promised him, your friend Greyhound, he'll get a funeral fitting for his sacrifice, and his family will be properly cared for they will no longer need to worry about food in the future. Thank you, your highness, Brian took a deep breath, I have to know. Fierce Scar, is he dead? No, he is still alive. Brian painfully closed his eyes. He would rather have had them not rescue Fierce Scar so that he would have been dragged to hell than both of them staying alive. But now, the chance to fulfill his wish became slim. There was no doubt that Fierce Scar was guilty, but the sins committed by nobility could always be redeemed with money. As long as his uncle was willing to protect him, it was very likely that Fierce Scar wouldn't die, it was most probable that he wouldn't even need to go to prison. Roland could naturally guess his thoughts, Hiller Dimitri, the uncle of Fierce Scar, is also a distant relative of the Elk family in Longsong Stronghold. The head of the family is Luke Dimitri, a vassal under Duke Ryan, but the fact that he is the distant uncle of Fierce Scar, here he paused for a little moment, will not affect the final verdict. Fierce Scar has been sentenced to death by hanging, and there are only three days left until his execution. If you can restore your body by then, you're invited to witness it if you wish to. Brian became startled, but. But your highness, members of the nobility can have their freedom bought, this rule you cannot offend dash. Roland waved his hand dismissively, indicating Brian shouldn't concern himself with it. He is a noble? Maybe for you, he was born in a branch family of the Elk family, so the status you and he have are as much a part as heaven and earth. However, it's a fact that he has neither a title nor any land, so he simply cannot be considered as nobleman. In addition, even if he were a nobleman, to lead an invasion into the prince's temporal royal residence and attempt to burn the food stocks, ignoring the fate of the 2,000 people in Border Town, carried enough guilt. Adding these three sins together, 
he could simply not be forgiven. At the time when Roland ordered the death of Tyre, he felt a little hesitant within his heart, but fear Scar belonged to the entirely inexcusable category. If he were successful, all of Roland's own future plans for Border Town would be destroyed, and he would never get a chance to turn his situation around. This was more hateful than a direct assassination attempt at Roland himself. As for the possibility that his action would annoy Longsong's stronghold, who cares? Since the other party did not want to cooperate with him, of course he would not compromise with them. They even tried choosing underhanded tactics to entrap the entire population of Border Town. At the same time this incident also taught Roland a lesson, this world's political struggle was different than what he knew from his former world, there they would mostly concentrate themselves on competing under the table, but here they were more inclined to set the table aside and use a much bloodier method. Rest well. You lost too much of your strength, so don't leave the castle. I have arranged for other people to take over your patrol's work, and at the end of the months of the demons, I'll hold your canonization ceremony. Your Highness, after hearing the words canonization ceremony, Brian looked at the prince with disbelief, you mean? Yes, you will become one of my knights, Mr. Brian, replied Roland with a smile. Prepare, stab. Vanner stabbed a wooden dummy with a pike, and on both sides his team members also did the same, with the same force and also from nearly the same angle. This time, it was already his 100th stab. He only had a tingling feeling left in his arms and he already thought that he would never survive this training. Despite the fact that he began to have this thought after his 50th stab, he still endured. After one week of conditioning it was already his natural reflex to obey every given order. Honestly, he himself was the most surprised that he could still endure. All, rest. After Iron Axe shouted his command, Vanner could suddenly hear the sound of exhaling from everywhere around him. Vanerlet also exhaled, and then he put down the pike as he sat on the ground. Now, he finally realized that their own militia was not responsible for being the errand troop for the guards or the knights. After one week of eccentric training, the training changed more to the fighting portion. For example, now they were standing on the city wall and were thrusting out their pikes according to the captain's orders, although these pikes were replaced with wooden poles, anyone could imagine their roles in the future. The logistics team would never do such exercises, so this also meant that they would confront the evil beasts on the wall. Naturally thinking about this, Vanner felt fear. He had even thought of sneaking away, but he didn't know why, seeing his teammates around himself with the thought of three meals a day and a good salary slowly changed his mind. Chapter 33, Gunpowder. Not even a quarter hour rest later, Iron Axe clapped his hands and shouted, Everyone stand up, His Highness, the fourth prince is coming. Vanner soon returned to his place, due to the special training he had before. He had learned to follow orders almost subconsciously, so he took his pike dummy and assumed the ready position for stabbing with his wooden staff. The prince and his followers were walking behind them on the wall. Vanner noticed from the corner of his eyes that the prince had slowed down his steps when he was near Vanner. Roland sighed silently, the sayings a late evening will destroy the morning and to get up too early will ruin the whole day were really true. Just when he had finished processing the aftermath of the raid on the castle, he was reminded that he had to inspect the militia's training results. Roland pitted himself. He hadn't slept the whole night, so now he was sleepy the whole day, but he had to come, since now the team had been transferred to the stage of combat training, and he, as the highest commanding officer, if he didn't show himself for a long time, the morale of his team would become unsteady. Well. What would someone usually say when reviewing the team? Roland thought for a bit, are we only comrades only during good times or are we also comrades during hardships? If he did not get an answer after shouting this slogan, the whole atmosphere would be very awkward. Maybe it would be better to just pull someone aside and talk with him, asking him for his impression and earning a good reputation. So he began to implement his new plan, and patted a young man who looked fairly sturdy on the shoulders. Is the training too hard and do you feel tired? Is eating three meals a day enough? Based on his past experiences of watching the news, his response to his questions should be a loud shout, not tired, and very good. But the result was completely different than what he expected. The man turned directly towards him and went down on one knee, which really shocked Roland. Vanner felt that he had been blessed, his royal highness the prince actually cared for him and even cordially asked him if he was tired from the training, when talking about the royal family or even only ordinary nobles, 
They were usually all reluctant to speak a word with their soldiers. He unconsciously imitated a knight's salute to honor his royal highness. Regardless if this ritual was appropriate for him, he only had one thought, later when he returned to the streets, he could be considered a new person. When he was asked to stand up, his brain was still a mess, so he couldn't even remember what he had answered. In the end, his royal highness had asked all of them. If someone had any comments or suggestions about the training, he would step forward. Suddenly Vanner's mind was completely clear once again, this was a good opportunity? If his thoughts were true and his highness militia had to guard the walls alone, they couldn't afford the heavy responsibility. Maybe my worries of running away or staying are unnecessary, right? He carefully thought about how to phrase the sentence, your honor, your respected highness, the current numbers of the militia is too small. If we line up in the same way that we have trained during training, when the demonic beasts strike, we will only be able to defend one third of the whole wall and won't survive. Even if the prince began to recruit several groups of militia now, Vanner was afraid that the training time wouldn't be enough. In addition, the weapons used by these people would also be a big expenditure, it was already difficult to supply for the 100 soldiers in the time left. Even now they were still holding their wooden staffs to train. If his royal highness prince could also realize this point, maybe he would recruit a group of mercenaries from other towns as their main defense. At least they would not need training and could be directly sent on to the battlefield, and they were already carrying weapons and armor, but the price to hire them was relatively high. Roland thought for a moment, nodded and said, yes, you're right, with our current militia force to guard the whole city wall, it isn't very realistic. Vanner felt very delighted, his highness actually, agreed with his view, but he did not expect the next words the prince said, demonic beasts are in a sense only a variant of normal beasts, they don't become more intelligent, right? Yes, your highness, their base forms are only ordinary animals, so the demonic beasts are still the same, even their habits are basically the same as they were before the change, but I have not seen many of them, so I'm not sure that this is true for all of them. That's what I wanted to hear. Although there are nearly 600 feet between the Redwater River and the foot of the northern mountain slope, we could lure them to attack a specific area which we prepared beforehand. You mean by using traps, asked Iron Axe. Yes we could use traps, but not the kind commonly used by hunters. Common traps are used to capture prey by camouflage, but I intend to do the opposite. We will set up roadblocks in the direction away from the city walls, such as fences, slopes, and ditches, forcing these mindless demonic beasts to walk around them. Continuous barriers will guide the prey to a designated place, at which we will place our main defense when Roland came to this point he directly looked at Iron Axe, as for how to lure these monsters, I think nobody knows more about it than you. After a short moment, Iron Axe answered, it's no problem to guide them, the wolves have hydrophobia, the wild boars have photophobia, and the other demonic beasts also have their own fears. But your highness, this way we would need to face all the evil beasts at one small point, will that not be too dangerous? If we only rely on pikes and bows, that would be true. Roland took a deep breath and said confidently, but now we have a new weapon. When it was time for the prince's departure, he once again came to Vanner, your observations were very good, what's your name? V.A. Vanniar, your highness. I will propose for you to be a vice captain for one of the teams to my chief knight, Mr. Vanner, I'm very satisfied, good work. Next to the house for the production of cement, Roland built a new house. It was for the production of snow powder, or more precisely, gunpowder. It only had one big room which had an area of 300 square meters and only one entrance. He also implemented the most stringent security regime. Two knights were always guarding the door, and anyone who wanted to enter were required to register first and go through body search, looking for something which could light a fire. Indoors, any source of fire was prohibited, so it was only possible to work during the day. In order to even prevent Nightingale from sneaking into the room, he hung up a cotton curtain above the door. This is what you called the new weapon. Carter was summoned to take a look at the new invention. He took the powder in his hand and took a sniff, this is not snow powder, right? Perhaps Iron Axe didn't know what snow powder looked like, but Carter had often participated in royal ceremonies, so he naturally knew how snow powder looked. It was the alchemic workshop's finest creation. The recipe was a secret to outsiders, but if the prince desired to know it, he would certainly be able to get it. It's snow powder, but not entirely, 
said Roland, it's the Alchemic Workshop's latest product improvement, I call it gunpowder. Gunpowder can be described as a product that was perfect for mass production. It didn't need any exotic materials. As long as you had charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter and mixed them at a ratio of 1 colon 1 colon 7.5 it could be produced without any technical barriers. In this time period, snow powder was mixed into a ratio of 3 colon 1 colon 1 and it also sometimes contains some strange materials, such as mercury, butter, honey, etc., which were sometimes mixed into it at a 2% ratio, but with the result of slower combustion and less gas release this held no advantage for the gunpowder. However, Roland knew that the alchemist would constantly test other ratios, and he predicted that they would only need 30 years until a recipe close to the original gunpowder's recipe would appear. In the history of Roland's former world, gunpowder was invented a long time before the production of the first cold weapon. The reason for this was because the recipe and the corresponding weapon manufacturing process didn't work in unison. However, what many people ignored was the fact that one did not need to rely on guns, the gunpowder itself was a very formidable weapon. Chapter 34, Trial Explosion At the beginning, when Roland started to build the cement creation house, he had already created a follow-up plan for future building projects. They were mostly centered on the northern mining area so that they could be easily guarded together, the construction of the brick cottage with a wooden ceiling was very fast, and didn't affect the building of the city wall. The vast amount of purchased saltpeter from Willow Town was transported to a nearby warehouse storage, and only helpers for grinding or weighing the saltpeter were allowed to enter the warehouse. The same procedure was implemented for the charcoal and sulfur as well, and the entire handling process for each of the materials was done by an entirely different group so that the risk of leaks was as minimized as possible. Roland weighed out 20 pounds of already produced gunpowder and slowly poured it into a good cut-out bag of sheepskin. This gunpowder had to go through a strict processing plan. It had to be compacted, air-dried, broken down with a hammer, screened, and filtered. If all of the powder was a uniform granular size, only then was it guaranteed to have an outstanding combustion performance. To prevent accidents produced by static, the entire production process was done without any metal products. Instead, they used ceramic and wood products. After pouring all of the gunpowder into the sheepskin, Roland stacked three more layers of sheepskin on top of the bag and then tied them together with a rope. That's all, asked Carter. Can this packet in front of him be called a weapon? Although it's a modified snow powder product, with sound alone, you can only scare someone, right? A peasant who has never been on a battlefield can affect a battle too, even if only a little. However, any trained soldier or mercenary would never look at them or respect them. But, the chief knight carefully reconsidered once more, the recent doings of his highness seemingly had no reason at all, but the effects were always very alarming. If the demonic beasts have similar intelligence to that of an average animal, maybe this stuff can be unexpectedly useful? For example, I heard that a loud explosion could frighten animals which would then flee, thereby reducing the pressure on the defender's side. Roland gave the wrapped up gunpowder to Carter, and then he took a pouch with tools to burn the powder, all right, we have to go outside of the city wall. Iron axe should already be waiting for us. To the west, about two miles from the city walls and located between the forest and the mountains was their designated testing area. Iron axe and several other hunters had been waiting here for a long time. In addition to iron axe himself, the others were the best local archers. When they had heard that the tasks given to them were from his royal highness, they couldn't wait and immediately followed iron axe. At present, Everyone knew that the new lord of Border Town was never stingy regarding the remuneration of his employees. According to Roland's orders, they built a fence out of wooden poles and ropes, which were surrounded the whole testing area so that no one would trespass it. In the direction of the city wall, he had arranged his knights to prevent anyone from accidentally approaching. Roland checked all the preparations once more and then asked, Have you brought the prey with you? Your Highness, it is here. Iron Axe dragged a cage with him and stepped forward. Carter, seeing the cage, noted that it was filled with a few pheasants and rabbits. Good, put a tied up animal every five steps away from the center, until you reach 30 steps from the center. Carter unnoticedly shook his head and tried to propose an improvement, your highness, I am afraid that you chose the wrong animals. You can't test the effect with them, they are very timid and only a little sound needed before will flee. 
So if you can scare them, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be able to scare the demonic beasts. Scare away demonic beasts. For a moment Roland slightly hesitated and answered, I do not intend to frighten them, although the sound of the explosion will be an amazing thing. He took the bag with the gunpowder from his chief, went to the center, and put it down. Then he cut a small opening into the bag with his dagger and let some powder leak out. With that done, he took out bottles containing gunpowder and sprinkled a small trail of it starting from the tear in the bag while continually stepping backwards. Today the weather was calm and was very suitable for the first gunpowder explosion ever. He stopped after he was nearly 100 yards away from the bag. Well, here it should be far away enough, he once again calculated the distance and after the confirmation, he ordered Carter, go and get the hunters. At the moment, Roland's heart beat faster as he was full of expectation. He had already done a small test before, so he wasn't worried about the test results. But what he cared about was that this would be a historical moment. Starting today, thermal weapons will have officially stepped on the stage, and he will forever be remembered as the inventor of this milestone. After everyone had been gathered together, Roland ignited the gunpowder. Carter, while lying on the floor, looked on as the distance between him and the sparks rapidly increased. In his heart, he could not accept this as correct. They were so far away that they wouldn't even hear a bronze bucket full of snow powder, so didn't speak ever about producing any damage so far away, but his royal highness the prince just had everyone lay down on the floor. But since the fourth prince ordered it and did it himself, it wouldn't be good if he said anything. The ground was frozen over from the cold temperature, across the chain armor, he could feel the chill spreading up. Carter shifted his body in preparation to save his chest from the cold when he suddenly heard a earth-shattering sound of an explosion. Since their distance to the gunpowder was too close, the sound of explosion and shock wave reached them at almost the same time. Carter felt his ears ringing and then the world suddenly quieted down. When the earth tremors began to lessen, he looked up and saw a black cloud slowly rising into the sky, followed by gravel and mud which fell like rain. For Roland, the impact was much smaller than for the chief knight. Even if it was only a little firecracker, he would block his ears immediately when igniting the explosive powder so he was naturally well prepared. The explosion was not like how explosions were in the movies, where they would always produce big fireballs. In the explosion, a lot of sludge was blasted off the ground, even reaching a height of more than 10 meters into the air. When the dust had settled down, the only feeling Roland had was that the sound was much louder than a loud firecracker. As for Iron Axe and the several other hunters, they had been stunned. They only knew from Iron Axe that this trip was to test a new weapon, but they had never expected that the momentum of the new weapon would be so fantastic. Perhaps it could only be compared to the sky's punishment, lightning, and thunder? Roland stood up and took everyone back to the center of the explosion. Here, the ground became a half-yard deep pit, and the rabbit nearest to the blast center had completely disappeared, leaving only the short wooden stake at which it was tied to in the ground. He checked the other animals one by one. The pheasants placed at the distance of 10 steps and 15 steps were lying motionless on the ground, apparently dead. Although there was no visible trauma, Roland still knew that they died due the shockwave. The only survivor was a grey rabbit 30 steps away, but its thin eardrums were destroyed, and blood was flowing out of the ears. Seeing someone coming close to it, it didn't try to struggle any longer and died, just as if the loud sound had taken its soul. Carter had to swallow his constantly ringing ears slowly began to function normally again. He slowly came to realize what his royal highness the prince meant when he said, I don't intend to scare them. Was it really modified snow powder? With this kind of a result, I'm afraid that the power of the alchemic workshop will become much superior to the astrologers. The view with which Iron Axe looked at the prince had completely changed, your highness, if the militia really would get such weapons, I think Border Town no longer needs to be afraid of the threat of the demonic beasts. I do not know myself, but can it or be mass-produced? Roland thought about it, probably not, until the months of the demons begins, I believe that we will only be able to produce 20 or 30 of them. The primary ingredient was saltpeter. In this era, the means of the production of saltpeter was very primitive, they would use the sewerage of the people and their livestock together with a lime mixture to separate out crystals of potassium nitrate. In addition to the upper nobility and the alchemic workshop, there was no great demand because there was almost no purpose for it, so there was not much of a production. If all of the saltpeter was used to make bombs, then it would soon be exhausted. 
they would need to use weapons like guns, bows, and crossbows as the main killers of the demonic beasts. Chapter 35, Home Nightingale was walking through the fog. When she was looking outside from inside the fog, the outer world was only by color, black, and white. The lines which were originally the borders of things were no longer very clear. The borders of straight lines, broken lines, and curved lines became ambiguous, like a picture painted by a child. This kind of feeling was somewhat hard to put into words, Nightingale took a long time to become familiar with how to distinguish between the borders. If Nightingale used her power correctly, she wouldn't be bound by anything while walking through the fog, even for something like a wall, just looking at it from a slightly different angle would be enough to find a way through, but when looking at it in the real world, there would definitely not be an entrance. In the fog, up and down, front and back were no longer a fixed concept, they transformed into each other, or you could even say they overlapped. For example, what Nightingale was just doing. She entered the castle, which was under the watchful eyes of the guards, without being noticed. Then, within a step, the lines around her changed unpredictably, and she stepped through the ceiling out of nowhere, arriving in Anna's room. For her, this was an entirely free world without any rules. Nightingale was able to relax only in the world of fog. Even though it was silent and lonely, she would never encounter any threat there. Most of the time, the world in the fog was black and white, but occasionally she could see other colors. For example, when she was looking at Anna. The difference between a witch and an average person was their magic powers. Nightingale could see this force flowing and fading in a witch, this was the only color in the world of fog, she had never seen anyone like Anna before, with such a full and intense color, an aquamarine luster surging within her, in its center it was close to incandescent, she was almost unable to look at it. All this made Nightingale very confused, because in general, the color would show the witch's ability and magic power. In her time in the Witch Cooperation Association, she had seen a lot of witches with the fire ability when they used magic. The luster within them was always the color of orange or red like the cloud of a living fireball, but regardless of size or brightness, other witches couldn't be compared with Anna. If this wasn't already difficult to understand, another point was even more incredible. Within her was such an enormous amount of magic, how could she still be alive? Within the whole Witch Cooperation Association, Nightingale had not found anyone with such an astonishing amount of magical power. Even if it were an adult witch, she would be a dwarf in comparison with Anna. If Anna were to become an adult. No, Anna would never have this opportunity. Nightingale had to sigh, because the stronger the magic power was, the stronger the bite would be. She could not even imagine what would happen when the time came for Anna to face her trial, she would likely face a terrible ordeal. The pain of feeling that her organs were torn from the inside out didn't let people lose consciousness until they gave up their resistance, accepting their death. They would be repeatedly subjected to constant pain. She walked out of the fog, letting her temporary depressed feeling fade away, and cheerfully said, Good morning, Anna. Anna had already become accustomed to the other side's unwanted behavior of suddenly appearing. She nodded her head, but did not answer, and continued practicing her flame instead. Nightingale rubbed her own nose and then went to the side of Anna's bed. Nightingale had already seen this kind of practice many times. She had even been watching when Anna had just started practicing. Accidentally igniting her clothes in the back garden shed, she always had a bucket full of clothes beside herself into which she could change. Later, she was able to make her flame skillfully dance at her fingertips, then, even Roland no longer supervised her practice but instead tore down the shed in the garden and turned it into a place to enjoy afternoon tea and sunbathe. Even so, according to the prince's orders from before, Anna continued to carry out her practice for one to two hours every day, but now in her own room. I brought fish cake, do you want to eat it with me? Nightingale took out a cloth from her bosom, opened it and divided the fish cake into a piece for each of them. Anna nodded after she smelled the fish cake. Go wash your hands before you eat it, Nightingale laughed. Fortunately, Anna didn't hate Nightingale, after all, it would not be good for Nightingale to speak to herself. All in all, Anna was obviously very concerned for Nana but didn't express her concern very much. In fact, when she was not in front of Roland, she rarely spoke. In contrast, Roland talked too much. He always had a lot to say. For example, when eating a meal, he would have so many rules, such as wash your hands before eating, don't eat too quickly don't pick it up and eat it after it has fallen to the ground, and so on, 
he could give a long statement for everything. At first, she was very impatient, but later she learned that it didn't matter because here she was the peasant and he was the master. After all, it was the fourth prince's castle, since she lived here and ate his food, she reluctantly began to listen to his speeches. Now, she was also getting used to these rules. She didn't know why, but when she herself, Anna, Nana, Roland and Carter would compete for places in line for hand washing, she would feel an inexplicable hint of fun. Anna reached into the bucket filled with well water and cleaned her hands, and then she lit a flame to dry them. After that, she took her piece of fish cake and sat at the table, cutely taking a small bite into her little mouth to slowly chew it. You really don't want to go back with me, Nightingale asked her once more. There, we will have a lot of sisters, they will take good care of you. Here, you can only live and do something within the range of the castle, don't you feel bored? Although they are called the impassable mountains, you can find lots of material to survive, and there we would all be one big family, everyone there has gathered together for the same purpose. Your magic power is so strong, they will happily welcome you. This winter, I'm afraid this winter will be your last. When she spoke until there, Nightingale trailed off. Perhaps it was already too late, she thought, even if they were back in the camp, for Anna to have such strong magic power, it would be almost impossible for her to get through adulthood. The only thing Nightingale could do for Anna was to stay by her side when she died. How was your life as a child, before you joined of the Witch Cooperation Association? Nightingale was startled by Anna's question, after all, she rarely asked any questions. I, used to live in a big city in the eastern part of the kingdom. Actually, it wasn't far from the capital. Did you have a happy life? Happy? No, she was unwilling to remember her daily life at that time, she had to depend on others, and was despised and mocked. When they found out that she had turned into a witch, her life became even worse than that of a cat or dog. She had a chain tied around her neck and was forced to work for them. So remembering this, Nightingale shook her head and whispered, why are you asking this? I lived in the old town areas. Anna once more told her own story. My father sold me for 25 gold royals to the church, but since his highness had let me out of the prison, I'm living a very happy life here. But, you cannot go out of the castle, and except Roland Wimbledon, the other people outside still hate witches. That isn't important for me, and he also said that he would change all this in the future, can't he do that? That will be tough. As long as the church hasn't fallen yet, they will always speak of the witches as evil. Anna didn't refute immediately and became silent for a long time. It was even so long that Nightingale thought that Anna would never talk about this point again when she suddenly asked, where did you have a better life? When you were with the Witch Cooperation Association or living here with us? You. What did you say ah, this question caught Nightingale totally off guard, well, of course. It would be with the Witch Cooperation Association, right? To tell the truth, she wasn't really interested in the search for the holy mountain but was interested in the place where all her friends were living. As for Border Town, if she hadn't heard that a witch was in danger, she would never have come to this town. So the answer should be very obvious, but why couldn't she say it the first time? Then, Anna began to smile. Nightingale had rarely seen her smile, her eyes were shining like a lake in which the morning sun was reflected, glistening. Inexplicably, she felt at ease, even if she wasn't in her own world of the fog. I heard Roland saying that the Witch Cooperation Association was looking for the Holy Mountain in the Northern Mountains and that the Holy Mountain was a secure home for all of you, but for myself I think I have already found my Holy Mountain. This castle was her Holy Mountain. Nightingale realized that although Anna wouldn't live for much longer, her soul already arrived at the place where most witches long to be. At this moment, from the other side of the door, running footsteps could be heard. Nightingale listened carefully they belonged to a panicking Nana. Then the door was opened, and it was really Nana Pine who rushed in. While tears ran down all over her face, she jumped into Anna's arms. WH what should I do? Sister Anna, my father has found out that I have become a witch. Chapter 36, Negotiation. Roland was dragged out of bed by Nightingale. After he had heard that Nana's father came for an audience, he was surprised at first. Soon he realized that this was a rare opportunity. If he wanted the girl to stay during the months of the demons and help fight against the demonic beasts, he would have to find a reason for the Pine family to remain in Border Town during winter. Originally, this was a very tricky situation. After all, the fourth prince's popularity among the nobility had plummeted, 
and he had a strained relationship with the stronghold. This were the reasons why most of them nobles leave border town. However, from the beginning, Roland hadn't considered working together with the nobles. They may have a lot of power, but they weren't suitable for a joint work. He quickly washed his face and dressed himself, then immediately went into the reception hall. Mr. Pine was already brought into the reception hall under the guidance of the guards. When Mr. Pine saw the prince, he immediately stood up, enraged, and asked, Your Highness, where is my daughter? This was the first time that Roland saw Nana's father. He had a muscular build, but wasn't too tall, and with his beard he had a very rough image. With his cotton coat that reached his waist and his leather pants that had very large pockets his dressing style looked more like that of a person from the Orient, rather than someone of noble rank. She's fine, Mr. Pine Dash. Why was she directly let through by the guards, while I was stopped at the door? Nana's father interrupted him out of anger. I need an explanation, your highness? Please bring my daughter out and let me see her. What was happening? Roland was full of wonder. He was convinced that Mr. Pine was clear about the situation that his own daughter had unfortunately become a witch. So it would be normal if Mr. Pine humbly asked him to hide the message, or he would just allow Roland to solve the problem. But Roland had really not expected that Mr. Pine would be so aggressive and wouldn't act according to aristocratic etiquette. As to why the guards let Nana come in without questions was only because of Roland's standing orders. Nana would come every few days to play with Anna, so the guards were already used to her coming. After considering for a moment, Roland gave the order to have a maid bring Nana over to them. No matter how rude the other side behaved, he was still Nana's father so it was only right to let the two meet and talk. If he showed any intention to send his daughter to the church or generally to abandon her, it wouldn't be too late to take measures against him. Nana and Anna both came together into the hall. At the moment Mr. Pine could see his daughter, the impertinence scene in his eyes immediately vanished. He opened his arms wide in the direction of Nana and shouted loud, Dad is here, so come to me. But the little girl was just hiding behind Anna, only exposing half of her head, I'll be sold to the church by you, right? Oh, you silly girl, what are you talking about? Naturally, I would never take you to the church, so let us go home together. This reaction somewhat confused Roland. According to Nightingale's story, Nana was seen by her father when she was using magic. Breaking out into a panic, she immediately fled to the castle in search of Anna. All along the way, she was followed by her murderous-looking father. But as it now seemed he was only looking with eyes full of love and care at his daughter, completely unlike the usual feelings of hate with which witches were typically confronted with. So, had it only been a misunderstanding? For a moment Roland hesitated, but then he decided to take the bull by the horns and said, Mr. Pine, your daughter became a witch, you surely know that. Your Highness, what are you talking about? I don't understand you. Mr. Pine angrily stomped his feet and then went toward Nana, trying to grab her hand. However, Anna stepped in front of him, blocking his view of Nana. Father, I have become a witch. I'm so sorry, whispered Nana. Hearing Nana mention it once more, Mr. Pine became somewhat anxious, don't talk nonsense. How would you become a witch? What has that guy Carl taught you? I shouldn't have ever let you go to the college, there they only teach that rhetoric church shit. Hearing him talking like this, Roland suddenly began to understand the situation. It seemed that Nana's father tried to cover everything for his daughter up. Did he misunderstand Roland's intentions? So because of this, he was so restless until he could see Nana. Anna he gave her a sign with his eyes. Anna understood and nodded. Then she stretched out her right hand, in the direction of Nana's father who still tried to reach his daughter. Flames began to spew out from her palm, direct near Mr. Pine's head, nearly burning him. Mr. Pine was shocked as he immediately stepped away from Anna. Nana also began to panic and hugged Anna's arm trying to stop her. Sister Anna, don't attack my father. Your Highness, this is a dash. As you can see, she is also a witch, just like your daughter. Roland spread out his hand and said, the reason why Nana has free access to the castle isn't what you think. Can we all calm down and talk about the future? At this moment, Mr. Pine felt like he had awakened from a dreamlike state, ah he needed to start twice, your highness, I, sit down first and then we can speak, Roland pointed to the table nearby, also have a cup of tea. Well, he sighed, my reputation was so bad, they even fear to let their children be near me. Now Roland fully understood Mr. Pine's rude behavior at the beginning, 
he had only shown his concern for his own daughter. When he had seen his daughter run into the prince's castle, and the guards were already used to her appearance, he couldn't think of any good reason for it. In case Roland was in Mr. Pine's position, he was afraid he would have tried to tear down the castle empty-handed. As for why he had denied back then that his daughter was a witch, his intention was very apparent. He feared that the prince would say Nana has fallen, so she needs to be purified. So he tried to convince himself and everyone else that his daughter wasn't a witch so that no one would care about her. Mr. Pine hesitated for a long time, but in the end, he still sat down and drank a whole cup of tea at once. After that, he wiped his mouth and looked a little embarrassed, sorry, my behavior was coarse. Excuse me, since when do you know that my daughter has turned into a heek, witch? Since before the winter. I wasn't the first one who had found out that she has awakened, it was her teacher Carl Van Bart. Due to her and Anna being friends, he sent Nana to me, so that I could look after her and that I could protect her. Explained Roland carefully, the last one and a half month, she came to the castle to learn her ability without fear of discovery. By the way, your daughter's ability is to heal. Is that right? Mr. Pine scratched his head, so that was the reason why the cat could suddenly run and jump again. Cat. Cough cough, in fact, it doesn't matter. When I came home, I saw a boy who was sitting in the doorway with a cat which was hit by a carriage in his arms. I planned to hide the cat from Nana's view so that she wouldn't be frightened. I didn't think that she had seen me and would immediately run to me looking for the cat. It was very obvious that the cat had been hit, and her leg was broken, he looked at Nana and Anna, so you were friends? Anna didn't say what she thought, but Nana quickly nodded her head. Mr. Pine seeing his daughter's reaction his expression softened a bit. Upon seeing this Roland asked, you do not seem to think that the witches were people tempted by the devil and had become his spokesperson. My daughter is undoubtedly not a wicked person. He categorically denied this possibility, no matter what she has become, I have no doubt about this. Anna's father and Nana's father were entirely different kind of people. Roland couldn't help but feel that he now could somewhat understand why Nana was always so carefree, always having a smile on her face. Such a family, for a child it was just like a warm cradle. I also do not think so, Mr. Pine, then Roland said bluntly, your daughter's ability to heal other people is of great significance for me. I want her to stay in border town, helping me to fight the demonic beasts during the months of the demons. Hearing this, Mr. Pine hesitated, your highness, I am afraid I will have to refuse your request. When the demonic beasts come, it will become very dangerous in this town. I cannot leave her in this small town. Since the Pine family didn't belong to the territory under the jurisdiction of Border Town, so even he as a prince, couldn't directly command them to stay. But as long as Mr. Pine was willing to sit down and talk, Roland was sure that he could convince him. Chapter 37, Family History The danger isn't as great as you think, Mr. Pine. If something is dangerous it will also always offer some opportunities. In his head the fourth prince went through all the information his assistant minister had collected once more I heard that you inherited your title from your father? He became a knight through merits gathered from battle, awarded the rank of baron and given his own territories. That is true confirmed Mr. Pine. It was at the time of the months of the demons. A small group of demonic beasts unexpectedly broke through the stronghold defense near the Redwater River and were running rampant. When Nana's father was on patrol, he encountered the rampaging demonic beasts. Instead of avoiding them like most people would do, he notified the stronghold, asking for reinforcements, and began to siege the demonic beasts to save the nearby town, even though he had no relationship with the town. While speaking, Roland observed the expressions of the other people, but Mr. Pine, you should know the things which happened at that time better than me. Your father called for the militia from the town. Then, with his attendants and the militia he fought the demonic beasts and won. That large battle was fought to stand up for the innocent. Yes his tone was a bit agitated, apparently full of longing for his own family history. There was also an unusually big one, some parts resembled a deer's and some parts a bull's. It was a fusion of both of them. It legs were thicker than my father's torso, and when it was ran, the ground trembled. If I were in his position, I really wouldn't have known how to beat the monster. But he did it. My father stood near a shallow trench, luring the furious demonic beast over. It accelerated and was trying to take advantage of its speed at the moment of their collision. My father laid down in the shallow trench and wedged his sword between two stones so that only the sword tip was visible. 
The seemingly unbeatable idiotic beast couldn't stop, and its belly hit the tip of the sword. The entire stomach was cut open, black blood and some intestines flowed out of its belly. It was so much that my father almost drowned within the trench. Even today, the spoils of that battle, the great horn of the demonic beast, hangs above my family's fireplace. Roland, who was sipping his tea leisurely said, it was an admirable fight, he followed the knight's code of faith, compassion, and bravery. Later he got his knighthood and a manor in the fiefdom of Jokol, who was still the lord of the Longsong stronghold at that time. Twenty-five years ago Jokol was promoted to the rank of a duke by His Majesty Wimbledon III, becoming the part-time guardian of the southern border. With this, the whole southern border territory was placed under his jurisdiction. Unfortunately, after his promotion, Joe Cole became an eyesore to his former supporter Duke Ryan. Your Highness, you might know well that, Mr. Pine's voice sounded somewhat frustrated, even when the ranks of Duke Ryan and Joe Cole were different, their levels of power were already even. Cole's blood could be traced back to a branch of the royal family, so his ancestry wasn't worse than that of Duke Ryan's. This was a political scheme. Roland sighed, Wimbledon III actually tried to check and balance their level of power. In order to understand this complicated relationship, Roland had to call for his assistant minister for explanations. The noble and feudal jurisdiction were extremely confusing. In theory, the higher nobility has the right to issue orders within the territory of the lower nobility. But the actual situation was much more complicated. Duke Ryan and Joe Cole were an example of this. Although he was placed in the western border territory under Duke Ryan, Joe Cole, as the king's directly announced count, he had no less prestige and power than Duke Ryan. When Joe Cole became the Duke of the Southern Territory, his power in his old territory became even stronger. This was a method of the royal family of Grey Castle to hold the power stable. But when you inherited the territory of your father, the trade and the agricultural production gradually faded Roland slowly said, but now, there is a new opportunity in front of you. What is this new opportunity? Surely you had heard of the famine two years ago, the stronghold was withholding the food for the next months because of the reason that the amount of ore mined by the inhabitants of Border Town was too small. This year, we are faced with the same dilemma again. The unexpected collapse of the Northern Slope Mine didn't leave any route of retreat for the people of Border Town. We must block the demonic beasts at the new city walls. Perhaps the fight won't go smoothly, but as I said before, facing this dangerous task also means a new opportunity for us. Mr. Pine had to first understand the meaning of what the prince said, so he only frowned and didn't immediately give his answer. To be honest with you, you do not really resemble a typical noble. Roland gently smiled, no noble would go out dressed like you, and your hands are full with crusts and calluses. Mr. Pine, you didn't let your father's inheritance down, right? You're a knight with excellent fighting skills. He certainly did not let his father down, Roland was very sure of this, or Mr. Pine wouldn't have trained and ran through the woods for a whole day. According to the information provided by Barav, in the last week, Mr. Pine had spent at least three days training in the forest. On each visit, he was always fully equipped, and if he couldn't afford it for his attendance, he directly hired some helper from the town of Orion. Some people were just born for battle, Mr. Pine was obviously such a person. If you will stay in Border Town, I will provide you with the opportunity to let you regain your father's glory. Just like he did, you will get the chance to obtain honor and outstanding achievements with only your sword and your courage. I'll also reward you with a territory in the east of the border town, and you will become a viscount appointed by me. Although this would be a rare situation, the commitment would be valid. As an adult prince, he was able to legally canonize viscounts, barons, and knights. However, he could only seldom confer such titles to other people. One, it would undercut the regional system of aristocracy, and two, if the other side refused the offer, it would become more awkward. Roland didn't care about the opinion of the local nobility, he just wanted Nana to stay in border town. As for refusing Mr. Pine, Roland wasn't too worried. After Joe Cole had become the guard of the southern border guard, his relationship with Mr. Pine's father didn't carry on. He had entirely abandoned the Pine family. When hearing this, Mr. Pine finally began to talk again, then. Your Highness, if I stay, can I still send Nana back to the stronghold? Until now, no one had ever tried to resist the demonic beasts in this place. If we fail, I do not want my daughter to be buried here. 
As I already told you in the beginning Mr. Pine, the danger in staying here is relatively low. Have you ever thought about what would happen if Nana was found to be a witch in Longsong Stronghold? There it would be entirely different than here in Border Town. The stronghold is completely in the possession of the church. They have already grown their roots in the city for a long time. Their believers and overseers are everywhere in the city. At the moment she is exposed, even I won't be able to save her. Roland paused, then added, Border Town will definitely not fall. When the months of the demons arrive and the demonic beasts come, I'll be on the wall to lead my people and fight alongside them. Our opponents are nothing more than a group of mutated beasts, they are not invulnerable. Your father had no cover and was able to win against them in an open surrounding. However, we have the new city walls. If, instead, I really only mean, if an accident does happen, I'll take measures to guarantee that Nana will immediately leave the town. He paused for a second, and naturally, Anna will also move. I will prepare a boat for them at the dock beforehand, so I can promise you that they will be safe. So, I will believe in you, your highness, when saying this, Mr. Pine stood up and went directly down on one knee to give the standard knight salute to the prince, and I am willing to fight for you. After Nana and her father had left, Anna rolled her eyes at Roland. What are you talking about? She firmly said, I'm not going anywhere. Chapter 38, The Era of Hot Weapons Iron Axe became aware of the fact that they were now under watch. The hunters who had participated in the test explosion moved together into a two-story house near the castle. Looking through the window, he could see that the house was encircled by stone walls and guards were stationed at the entrance. He did not mind this regulation, and the fact that His Highness only sent two guards to oversee them showed that he trusted them. Until now, Iron Axe continued to repeat the roaring explosion within his head, until now, there was never a weapon that could bring him such a strong shock. In the extreme south of his homeland, he had seen how orange fire erupted out of the ground, and this fire could continue to burn for decades, he had seen endless storms with monstrous waves, however awfully unpredictable these powers were, they were the will of Mother Earth or the God of the Sea, they were the iron whip that disciplined all living things. But now, His Highness began to challenge the power of the gods, obtaining a power only seen during Heaven's punishment, although when compared with the real lightning and thunder, the difference was still great, reaching such a realm of power wasn't possible for humans. In the Sand Nation, anyone who would participate in such a demonstration or later use it would normally get their tongue cut off. Of course, this was not the safest way to keep secrets. Only the dead could keep secrets from spreading. As a foreigner, they would only see him as blasphemer, and it was forever impossible for a foreign clansman to get into the core hierarchy. The prince knew that Iron Axe was only a half-blood, but he still allowed him to witness the curse of fire. Even more, he also let Iron Axe be responsible for the formation of the hunting squadron. The trust his highness had within him was burned deep into Iron Axe's heart. During his time in the Sand Nation, he had experienced countless betrayals of friends or family who framed him for their wrongdoings. When he fled to the kingdom of Greycastle's south border, he still had to suffer discrimination because of his half-Sand Nation and half-Greycastle lineage. He eventually arrived in Border Town, disheartened. Here, he intended to rely on his hunting skills to spend the rest of his life in peace. However, he had never expected to meet His Royal Highness, the Prince, here. And of all things, he had never expected that the Prince would even trust him. He had no doubt that with this new weapon, the one who would win the battle for the throne would be Roland Wimbledon. When he thought about fighting for the future king and the promising opportunities he would get, Iron Axe became wholly excited. Everyone, come down to gather. When Iron Axe heard this shout, he took a quick look through the window and saw Roland's chief Knight Carter and four other knights coming. Iron Axe first finished dressing himself, then walked down the stairs to stand at attention in front of Carter. Since he had participated in the militia training, he knew that His Highness preferred discipline, since he would adjust them to a unit of uniformity. The other members of his hunting squad were a lot slower. It took about six to seven minutes before they lined up as a team. Everyone, follow me to the old place. Carter didn't care much about how the hunter squad lined up. Instead, he went straight to the city wall. It was still the same place as the explosion test. But this time, His Highness didn't set up a safety area. In addition to Roland, there were already four knights waiting for them, they were all Carter's subordinates. Iron Axe noted that His Highness had begun to play with an unusually shaped iron stick while explaining something to the knights. 
When Roland saw the hunting squad, he came to them and asked, How is living at the new houses? Have you already become used to it? Thank you for your highness care everyone bowed and stated that the new homes were comfortable. In fact, the new houses they moved into were many times better than the old homes. At least they had no air leaks, and the roofs were also not made of translucent straw bedding, but were made of neat and tidy tiles instead. This is good, Roland nodded, pleased, the current arrangements are needed out of security reasons. But you will only need to live there until the end of the months of the demons, then you will be able to move back to your former living places. In addition, the salary for the first month has been paid to your families, and every weekend you will be allowed to see them face to face. Of course, you will be accompanied by guards. Thank you for your kindness, your highness, said the hunter squad cheerfully. This was really a bit surprising for Iron Axe. Leaving aside the law of Sand Nation, even the military management of Grey Castle shouldn't be this lax. Could it be that this was because of His Highness kindness? Iron Axe became somewhat worried, if His Highness wanted to compete for the throne, he needed to be ruthless, this he knew well from his life in Sand Nation. However, when the fourth prince began to talk about new weapons, based on the development of the gunpowder, he put his worries into the back of his mind. Iron Axe stared without blinking at the two iron bars which the prince had placed in front of them. These weapons are called guns, Roland said, next, I'll tell you how to use them. In the next half hour, they had to learn how to use the new weapons. Take the black powder which was the cause of the explosion and fill it into the barrel of the gun. Then, a lead ball was stuffed with a poker into the barrel, straight to the end. After that, they had to pour the gunpowder into the igniting chamber, aim, and then pull the trigger. Iron Axe had considered himself to be a master of many weapons, whether it be swords, knives, hammers, axes or spears. He was well trained with all of them, but he had also needed long years of training and combat skills to master them. Learning how to use a new weapon in only 30 minutes, he was afraid that the speed to master this weapon could only be compared to the crossbow. The other gun was handed to Carter. The chief knight was also full of interest in the novelty of this weapon, and he didn't want to put them down. After several rounds of simulation, Roland set up two targets to let them see the power of the guns. The first target had wooden armor in front of its chest. The wooden armor was held up by two knights standing at a distance of about 30 feet away. The prince led Carter and Iron Axe through the shooting technique. Then, they aimed and pulled the trigger. When they heard the loud sound of fire, every person present jumped up out of shock. Iron Axe was no exception, but soon only surprise was left on everyone's face. Looking at the target's wooden armor, they could see a small hole. The lead ball had cleanly shot through the chest armor's thickest part. Before shooting, Iron Axe had carefully observed this armor. It was clearly not a handicraft workshop's inferior product built from bad materials. The marks of the hammer and anvil on the neckline proved that this was a product of Grey Castle's blacksmith standard. The thickest part was half a finger thick and was strong enough that it could ward off a direct hit from a crossbow, fired at the closest distance. To deal with this kind of armor, a heavy crossbow or a warhammer would be a wise choice. So comparing it with a crossbow, the difficulty to use the weapon was the same, but the power of a gun was far better than that of a crossbow. In addition, the gun's loading speed and the loading speed of a crossbow were nearly equivalent, so, looking at the target which was 30 feet away, Iron Axe couldn't see a problem. Your Highness, how many weapons do we have of this kind? asked Carter. Currently, only these two and until the months of the demons, we can only produce two more at most. Iron Axe could see that hearing this, Carter was clearly relieved. He was able to guess Carter's thoughts. If this weapon was easy to manufacture, then with only a few days of training, everyone would be able to train a large number of express warriors who were bringing guns to battle. Then people at any age, with any strength and even any sex, even a fragile woman, could be a significant threat to the knights. Although the shock he got from this weapon was smaller than that of the Curse of Fire, it still was a powerful weapon. Iron Axe thought, with this great power they could easily kill a large number of rugged flesh demonic beasts from high up on the wall. Even if they would face a mixed species, with these firearms, maybe the outcome would be not so embarrassing. But the real significance of such a weapon was clear to Roland. He personally opened the door to the time of wars with hot weapons. Chapter 39, The Winter is Coming. Roland was standing on the city wall, facing the north. This past month, he repeatedly checked the castle, the mine, and the city walls in a kind of three-point loop. 
He checked them for every possible detail so that he wouldn't miss anything. The militia became very adept at handling their weapons. Due to Carter's repetitive drills, they were able to stabilize the pike until the militia captain loudly gave the command to slash with their pikes. Standing behind the militia was the hunter squad. Every hunter who remained in border town and was good with either the bow or the crossbow was incorporated into this squad. These seasoned hunters were the backbone for killing the demonic beasts. Standing only 12 feet away from demonic beasts on the city wall, it was nearly impossible for them to miss their target. The last line of defense were Iron Axe, Carter, and two hunters from the elite team who were under Iron Axe. The parts manufactured by the blacksmiths were enough to let Anna weld four flintlocks. They would only shoot the flintlocks when a mixed species attacked or the hunters with crossbows were unable to penetrate the skin of the demonic beasts. Their location on the wall wasn't set, so the four of them had to patrol the whole 200-yard long defense line. If there was a need for them anywhere, they would appear. As for the explosives, they were kept under heavy protection next to the wall in the warehouse. To keep everyone safe, the gunpowder was stored in its three components, and it would only be put together on the city wall when needed, after all, if the powder detonated at the wrong time, the self-inflicted damage would be even greater than the damage from the demonic beasts. The teeth of the demonic beasts may be able to crush the cement, but if the explosives went off, the whole wall would be destroyed. So far, Roland had organized two test runs, both including the use of the explosives. Thanks to these two exercises, the militia was used to the loud roars of the explosions and were no longer so scared that they threw their weapons away. The other advantage was that when the defenders discovered that the prince held such incredible weapons in his hands, the team morale suddenly began to skyrocket. Your Highness, Barav tightened his collar, we have already spent most of the ore income in the last half month so if the months of the demons actually goes on as long as the astrologers have predicted, I fear that the food won't last till the end of winter. Then I want you to fill up the entire vault, Roland said without hesitation, make another deal with Willow Town and don't make it the only one. The first steam engine has already been transported to the mine, and the gravel from the collapse has already been completely cleaned up. During the entire winter, we can still get a little yield from the mines. Rough stones are especially in demand. Do not emphasize on price. Instead, sell them as soon as possible so that our wheat and meat storages are always as full as possible. Barab nodded, I'll give out the orders immediately, your highness. Just. Seeing the hesitant look on his assistant minister's face, Roland certainly understood what he wanted to say. Do not worry, I have already arranged a boat. If the line of defense is broken, I will leave the town immediately. That's excellent to hear said Barav, relieved. Roland smiled at him and said, you can go. After all, you have enough to do. I have to look for someone else. After Barav left, the prince slowly stepped onto a watchtower. This place was at the center of the city walls and was their highest point. From here, he could overlook the whole front line, parts of the jungle, and the nearby hills. At such a eight, the wind was blowing quite strongly but Roland didn't care. Only on this high and open platform could he somewhat calm down and forget the coming war. You lied to him, someone next to him suddenly said, you don't intend to leave this town. Life is already so difficult, keeping a few secrets sometimes is good for everyone. You're talking nonsense and don't understand the situation. If you already consider the identity of a prince as a difficulty, what would you see us as? Nightingale emerged out of the fog, even if you will not be the king, you still have to live through the five-year-long struggle for the throne because you're one of the main parties. Compared to worrying about such unimportant matters, you should better accompany Anna. I'm afraid, she doesn't have much time left. For a moment Roland remained silent, I don't think that she will die during the months of the demons. Why? She said that she will not lose to the devil's bite, he paused for a second, and I believe her. You actually believe what a witch says, Nightingale shook her head, but we are cursed by the devil. Are you? Well, I also believe you. Brian was wearing his civilian clothes and was standing in front of Greyhound's tombstone. He gently stroked the surface of the new stone, it was a pure white stone and on its surface were engraved the words, in memory of one of the silent heroes of Border Town. Greyhound. I've already realized my biggest dream. At the end of the months of the demons, His Highness the Fourth Prince will hold the canonization ceremony for me. But, I don't want to sit on the bed waiting for my canonization. My wounds have already healed so the city wall is the place where I should be. 
The months of the demons is near, and the demonic beasts may be strong, but they will have to go through the line of defense the militia established, and will no longer able to advance. I will also take over your part in defending the town, and brandish my sword in your name. All this will not be the end. Your murderer is still alive, but he will not live much longer, his highness already promised this to me. The next time I come to you, I'll bring good news. Brian bent down and placed a bouquet of flowers at the gravestone. So goodbye, my friend. Sister Anna, are you scared? Nana, who was lying on Anna's bed, asked her this. Afraid of what? The devil's bite we have to face this winter. I became a witch during the autumn of this year, so it will be the first time I have to face it. Well, the first time, Anna thought, will be very painful, and sometimes you think that you can't wait any longer and wish that you could finally die. Ah. Nana began to shout out of shock, but she immediately covered her mouth. But you will survive, just like me. I do not know, whispered Nana, I'm not like you, so strong, and afraid of nothing. I'm not really that strong, said Anna as she closed her eyes. The scene when she met Roland for the first time emerged in her mind. Down there in the cold and dark dungeon, Roland's clothes were draped over her body. He softly said that he would hire her, until now, she still got goosebumps when remembering this. Sometimes you will encounter situations or things that will give you the will to live on, even if you need to struggle hard to survive. Such as, for example, meat marinated in soy paste, and aside, how should I know what you dream of? Ah, uh, seeing that Nana was entirely staring at her, Anna wiped her face with her hand, what are you looking at? Is there some dirt on my face? No, Nana shook her head, I'm just a bit surprised, you've never talked to me so much. Sister Anna, the appearance you had when you just closed your eyes and thought about the past, you were so beautiful. Anna rolled her eyes, jumped out of the bed, and went to the window. Nana followed directly behind her, what are you looking at, do you want to flee into the forest? The forest is in the west, answered Anna snappily, here you can only see the red water river. Sister Anna, look. The little girl pointed at the sky, Anna was startled, then opened her window. A surge of wind mixed with little snowflakes came into the room. She held out her hand, catching the flower like sparkling snow. She could feel a chill coming from her fingers. It's snowing? After long silence, Nightingale opened her mouth and began to speak once more, you actually didn't lie. Of course, Roland laughed, I have very little reason to lie. Nightingale said nothing. She only tilted her head, and an unknown look emerged in her eyes. Suddenly, she felt something cold on her neck and she couldn't help herself from shrinking away. She looked up only to find that unbeknownst to her, the snow had begun to fall on the walls. Under the gray sky, there seemed to be an uncountable number of snowflakes. They danced in the wind, flying all over the place, accompanied by the shouts of the militia. The months of the demons had begun. Chapter 40, Letter. The firewood was burning violently, but Gerald Wimbledon didn't feel much of the heat. Although he was in a large tent made of stitched leather, and the ground was also completely sealed without any air leakage, he still felt cold. His toes were especially cold, they were almost frozen to the point that he couldn't feel them any longer. This damn place, even the urine freezes when you take a piss he spat and stood up. He grabbed the table on both sides with his hands. When he used all his strength, so that even his hand became red from the effort, the six-foot square wooden table became lively and left the ground. After he put the table at the edge of the fire pit, Gerald felt a lot more comfortable. He took off his shoes and put his feet next to the fire, warming them in the heat. He spread out the text scroll with his hands once more and continued to write the unfinished letter. Dear lovely Olivia, it has been already a month since I came to Hermes, but of course, the church prefers to call this place their new holy city. If it wasn't for the months of the demons, I wouldn't want to stay here for even a moment. I just want to get back to you and share the warm bed with you once more. Faithful to the convention, the church is monitoring us with their own forces instead of supporting us. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Speaking about the church, I have to admit that what they were able to do is really amazing. I can still remember the time when I was here for the first time. It was around 20 years ago. In addition to the mountains and rocks around Hermes there was nothing here besides a little church at the bottom of the mountains. But now, they have not only opened up a road for a carriageway up the mountain peak, but they have also established a large-scale fortress city. During the summer, you really should come and take a look at this city with me. The new holy city is even grander than our grey castle. 
Do you remember the theater in Grey Castle? You and I had gone there to watch The Revenge of the Prince. You were so impressed with the theater's architecture, the interior was so spacious that it was unbelievable. But after you see the Holy City's new Hall of Military Affairs, you will think that the theater in Grey Castle was only a shack. It is hard to call it a building, I think it's more like a piece of exquisite art. It's so spacious that it could swallow five theaters. However, not a single pillar supports the exterior walls. The walls are held up by eight behemoth-like demonic beast bones. Between the curved bones are many smaller bones which are connected by hemp ropes, and the roof hovers in midair as if it were on a pole. How could they think off a building like this? And those bones, if they were stripped from a demonic beast, I bet that guy's size was certainly more than a hundred feet. Probably only in Hermes will you be able to encounter such a monster. But honey, please do not worry, even if the demonic beasts are massive, they are still the devil's minions. In the presence of God's eye of retribution, no evil can escape God's jurisdiction. Whether it is a demonic beast, a witch, or the devil himself, their only fate is to turn into ashes. When he had written until here, Gerald Wimbledon put down his pen and loosened up his tingling hands. This was really strange, normally he could hold his 15 pounds heavy two-hand sword all day, but while holding the pen he was only able to write a few sentences before he felt so tired. He smiled in a self-deprecating way and thought that he really was made for a yokel's life. When speaking of demonic beasts, I suddenly think of my fourth brother. He was assigned to Border Town, such a miserable place. I'm afraid he has already turned tail and fled to Longsong Stronghold, even there, the demonic beasts will not be able to reach him and the stronghold's defense is comparable to Hermes. But I think this is not his fault, even if I went to that place, I would only be able to take refuge in the stronghold. Here it can be seen how unfair my father is. Just because our younger brother performed exceptionally intelligently from an early age, he decided to let him inherit the throne. Father forgets that he himself didn't win the throne with calculating means. Since our mother's death, it has become more and more difficult for me to find out what father is thinking. Gerald hesitated before he began to write the next part of his letter, he did not know if he should tell his real intentions to Olivia or not. He paused for a moment, but then he decided to write it down. If his plans went well, he should already have arrived at the palace in Grey Castle before she received his letter. My dear, astrologer Anster was right. If I do nothing, ultimately the throne will not end up in my hands. Anster observed the stars and what he said was, the star of the apocalypse will burn for the next four months before it leaves its orbit again. This tells me that I obviously have little time left and cannot wait in vain any longer like this. After today's battle, I will quietly return to the capital and meet my father, and I will take my loyal soldiers with me. Here maybe I have much less opportunities to get riches like in the city of Golden Harvest, but instead there is no shortage of brave warriors here. I just have to throw some coins around and make some promises, and they will follow me like hungry wolves, and help me reach my goal. Of course, I do not want to start a revolt. I just want to personally ask my father why he gave the orders to start the battle for the throne. In the end, what was it that let him forget that I, as his eldest son, have the right of inheritance? Anster has already arranged everything for me. Olivia, my love, you will only need to wait a little longer. The day when I become the king is the day that I will marry you as my queen. If I fail miserably, you shouldn't come back to the capital, but instead, you should stay in the kingdom of eternal winter. Love you, Gerald. He carefully folded the letter and put it in an envelope, then sealed it with wax. After checking it a few times, he knocked on his table and his personal guard quickly entered the tent. You have to deliver this letter to the hands of the Rose family in the freezing wind mountain range. You do not have to travel all day and night. Don't even take a horse, just travel dressed as an ordinary traveler, as a passenger on a wagon from town to town. You only have to remember one thing, this letter must be hand delivered. Yes, your royal highness. Good, you may leave. After Gerald waved his guard away, he simply sat down at the table once more, letting his feet hang over the fire pit. If something happened, he would have no way out. He closed his eyes, recalling scenes of his childhood. At that time, he was playing hide and seek with his second brother and his third sister in the king's garden. When his third sister fell down, she needed her two brothers to take care of her. Exactly when had it began that the three of them became more and more like strangers? Gerald shook his head, putting his confusing thoughts aside. It wasn't suitable for him to become sentimental, he thought, 
there was only one possibility to end this, he himself had to sit on the throne. At this moment, the dull sound of a horn could be heard in the tent. Oh 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 dash. I'm coming, he jumped up from the table and put on his shoes. Stepping out of the tent, he saw that the whole camp was a riot. Everywhere, soldiers were running and waving flags, merging into one big chaos, getting into battle formation. From the distant mountains a muddy echo came in continuous stretches. When the horn blew, it meant the demonic beasts were attacking. Come with me. He rode on his war horse, taking his guards with him. Only one person remained standing on the walls of the holy city, in order to experience its grandeur, it was like an insurmountable natural moat, standing across the path through the impassable mountain range. The pass to the top was flat and wide, it was wide enough for dozens of people to pass through side by side. At the beginning of the path, there were cliffs formed by a glacier on both sides, but the later part was a plateau. This was why the church desperately wanted to build the new holy city to the top of the mountain. Using this terrain, they built a line of defense that was almost impossible to break through. However, Gerald Wimbledon looked at it more in long run. They were able to transport so many stones and timber from the foot of the hill to the top. In just 20 years they were able to build a city in Hermes, the power the church had exhibited was astounding. But regardless of how tired he was of doing business with the church, Gerald had to admit that they also had their strong points. If they didn't build the stronghold in Hermes, all countries on the continent would have had to face a catastrophe. They were also responsible for the convention against the demonic beast horde. Every year during January when the demonic beasts attack, the four kingdoms which border Hermes must send troops to support the church and fight together under the church's verdict. Their four banners were floating in the wind. A snake wrapped around the scepter of the Kingdom of Dawn, the shield and sword of the Wolf's Heart Kingdom, the Iceros of the Kingdom of Eternal Winter, as well as the Tower and Pike of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. Looking at the black spots appearing in the distant sky, Gerald Wimbledon clenched his great sword. Chapter 41, The Appearance of the First Demonic Beasts As Brian had said, once it began to snow in Border Town, it would not stop soon. In one night, the town had been covered in a layer of white glaze. During the early morning, the snowfall had eased off. Only a few snowflakes occasionally dropped from the sky, but the weather was still grey. When he thought about how he would not see the sun for several months, Roland thought the idea was still a bit inconceivable. This was simply illogical, he thought, though it was already very weird that magic was a common thing in this world. However, how could demonic beasts have an impact on the sky? Unfortunately, he didn't have any weather satellites to look at this world's cloud formations. Walking on the road in the direction of the western city wall, Carter couldn't help but exclaim, the town is deserted, there were still a bunch of people who followed the nobles who withdrew. That's good, at least they will not hold us back answered Roland as his breath fogged up in the cold air, I have arranged for Barav to hold a census during the winter. What is a census? It is a statistic produced from going door to door, counting the number of people who stayed behind, asking them for their names and what kind of a job they have. All of this will then be registered. Roland explained, as a result, during the war we will know how many human resources we can deploy, and after the war, pension can be implemented quickly and efficiently. Ah, uh, what? Carter blinked confusedly and then laughed, your highness, you are really not the same as before. Oh, in the past you would say something, and I wouldn't understand it. You would do some unfathomable and mysterious things, but after all, they did not confirm with the identity of the prince. And now, Carter paused and seemed to consider his next words, whether it was those strange training regulations or the novelties of the alchemic workshop, the results were surprisingly effective. Perhaps this is what my grandfather meant when he said, extraordinary people are extraordinary, because they can always see possibilities which ordinary people overlook. I have a feeling that there really is a possibility for you to become king. Yet, yeah, suddenly Roland got a warm feeling within his heart. Is there any better feeling than when other people recognize your hard work? For a short time, he felt full of strength and felt that the grey sky wasn't as depressing as it was before. As the prince arrived at the wall, the militia, who had already cleared away all the snow, vowed to pay their respects. Roland thought that they should also learn to salute, and he asked how was the situation last night. There were no traces of demonic beasts, replied Iron Axe, your highness, according to past experiences, we will still have a relatively stable time period after the first snowfall. 
During this period, the number of normal animals is still larger than the number of demonic beasts, and if there are demonic beasts they will be of the weaker species. Roland nodded, you still have to continue to be vigilant. The regional rear walls had been transformed into barracks, so if there was no danger, most people could stay in the camp to rest and save energy. Roland implemented a rotation system, taking into account the low winter temperatures. Each team would only need to perform two hours of patrolling before they would be replaced. All these measures were set by Roland. He had asked Brian how it was in Longsong stronghold and learned that they had no rotation system against the demonic beasts. The new recruits would be assigned to watch the movements of the demonic beasts and had to stay on watch the whole day, so consequently they would slack off, to the point that situations where soldiers deserted would occur. During the winter there were 20 to 30 people who were hanged because of dereliction of duty or violation of military orders. If they found traces of demonic beasts, it would become a mess because they didn't assign people to their own defense sectors. Thinking of the level of the art of war during this time, Roland already had a clear understanding of it. They paid extreme attention to personal honor and valor, and even emphasized plundering. Even knights would be in the front lines when charging into a city, nevertheless they didn't need to plunder too much. Roland once more patrolled along the wall and saw that everything seemed to be going smoothly, but Roland found out that he had ignored a problem. That was the roadblocks. These obstructions were currently still clearly visible and would lead the demonic beasts towards the right section of the wall, but if what Brian said was true and the snow would fall for two to three months without any interruption, it could come to the point that the demonic beasts wouldn't see any obstructions and would attack all of the 600-yard long wall. His militia force was clearly too small to attend to such a large battlefield. Sending soldiers down to clear the snow was a bad idea, because a few species like the demonic wolves were extremely agile, so he would definitely lose soldiers. Perhaps he would have to rely on the power of the witches. For example, he could let Nightingale take Anna out of the city to melt the snow with her fire and then sneak back, just like how she had brought Nana in and out of the Pine family's home. At this point, he heard a call from an observer on his left side. Look in front. Roland and Carter both looked towards the position the observer had referred to. There, a group of small shadows crawled out from the snow, moving slowly in the direction of the wall. The hunter who was in control of this defense section turned to Roland and asked, Your Highness, you say whether or not. Handle the situation according to the former drills, so judge the situation for yourself to determine whether you should blow the horn, Roland ordered, at this point, you are more experienced than me. The soldier hesitated, but he eventually pulled the string off his crossbow, and stood further down the wall to observe. Roland nodded his head in satisfaction. For now, when the number of demonic beasts that would attack Border Town was still unknown, it would be most important to maintain order on the wall. After all, they could quickly organize their defense according to the steps drilled into them from before. Gradually, the shadows came closer to the wall. When they were 50 yards away from the wall, Roland was finally able to clearly make out their appearances. Probably a variant of foxes? Their fur was grayish-black and their eyes were red. When they were at the walls they were panting heavily. It looks like it wasn't long ago that they were turned into demonic beasts. They aren't a threat, said Iron Axe while aiming with his bow. You mean they were infected by the breath of hell which was expulsed in the west? It doesn't happen only in the west, Carter came over and answered. The gates of hell can open anywhere in the mountains, there is no place safe from it in the mountains. In the north, there is an especially large path which is often under the attack of the demonic beasts. There, it seems that a part of the never-ending impassable mountain range was cut off. For more than a decade, this path was the main direction of attack from demonic beasts. The maniac monsters only lingered for a short moment at the base of the wall before they raised their heads and released grim growls towards the crowd on the wall while preparing to leap. However, Iron Axe released his bowstring, and his sharp arrow accurately penetrated the neck of one of the demonic beasts, firmly nailing it to the ground. Roland noted that the blood which flowed out from the beast was black. It was the same kind of erosion for the demonic beasts and witches, but why could the witches still save their consciousness and be saved after their awakenings, when the animals would always turn into maniacs while their bodies mutated? If I have the opportunity, I need to go and take a look behind the mountain of despair, thought Roland. In the prince's memory, it was a place where no human being could set foot, it was the place where the gates of hell opened. 
However, because no one had ever visited it, most of the knowledge of it came from ancient books, and he had no way to verify the rumors, so he had some doubts about the gates of hell. Chapter 42, Accidents. What happens when a demonic beast bites a human? Roland asked. Will they become the same like the demonic beast? Roland hoped it wouldn't turn into a medieval version of Resident Evil. After all, with their current level of technology they had no way to extract the virus and produce the required antigens. Of course not, Iron Axe gave Roland a kind how can you ask such a question, look, they would turn into a corpse. What about their meat, can we eat it? Carter exclaimed loudly, your highness? How can you think about eating the meat of demonic beasts, they are contaminated with the breath of hell, ah. Uh, Roland looked at Iron Axe, who nodded and said, your chief knight is right, I have cut off meat from some demonic beasts to feed to my dogs. The result was that my dogs died shortly after eating the meat. That happened? That's really a shame. Roland sighed, during this time, the food sources were scarce. If they were able to eat the demonic beasts the winter months would turn into months of simple harvest. Think about it, the whole forest of animals would turn mad and run in the direction of border town, so the militia would even be able to save hunting gear. After he walked along the whole wall, he decided to pay a visit to Nana. Roland had requisitioned the residence of a noble who recently left border town and used it as a field hospital. Of course, he claimed it as a school for foreign medicine. But just in case, it was near the city walls and was one of the best guarded places in border town. When the former owner of the residence returned to Longsong stronghold he had taken all his property with him, and the other inhabitants of border town were always ready to give up their homes. So, the housing was quite large, but they couldn't have many murals, carpets, porcelain vases, or other kinds of decorations. If it wasn't fairly clean, it would just look like a house that was vacant for a long time. Roland turned the first floor into one big room. Only the stairs to the upper floor and a small hallway were left. Then, he put ten beds into the room. With this, his hospital was finished. It was quite a simple shape, there were no nurses and no doctors, even the ten beds were unlikely to be used at all, after Nana's treatment the patients weren't required to lay in the beds, her treatment immediately bore fruits. During the day, Nana would normally stay on the second floor of the hospital and Anna would come by when she herself had nothing to do. Sir Pine and Brian were responsible for the first floor, and two guards were stationed at the entrance. However, Roland did not expect that the first patient of the field hospital would be a worker from the Northern Slope Mine instead of a soldier from the militia which defended the walls. Nils felt his hands trembling. When he heard the hoarse scream of iron again, he tried to pick up his pace once more, but even with his fastest speed he couldn't fly. This was all because of his negligence, he thought. Damn, how could he forget the repetitive warnings of his senior knight? If he had known earlier, he wouldn't have grasped his chance to work with the big guy. Since the big guy was installed at the mine gate during the night, the miner's work became a lot easier. Originally, the most tiring part of the job was to drag the ore out of the mine when the mining basket was filled with stones. Generally, two people would push from the back and the rest would pull from the front. After years of usage, the originally uneven tunnel ground became flat due to the transporting of the baskets. The pad at the bottom of the iron ore basket also required frequent replacement. A week ago, the chief knight commanded that the senior knight and his men to transport a lot of strange shaped parts made out of metal up to the mine, and then in the next few days they assembled them into a furnace. Nils had absolutely not foreseen that this furnace could move by itself when fueled with fire. It could not only move, but it also had extraordinary strength. The senior knight had said that it was his royal highness invention and was seemingly called the steam engine. First, a basket had to be fastened with a rope to the steam engine, then a fire had to be lit before the big machine would begin to hum. Then, the winch began to turn and the basket was quickly hauled towards the mine entrance. Incredible? The senior knight had selected a person responsible for the steam engine after several test runs. When Nils was selected, he was very pleased with himself since he had waited a long time for such a good opportunity. After all, he just had to stand in front of the machine, he would no longer have to dig out stones or minerals, and he would never ever need to push a basket. That last mine collapse still left him spooked. The words the senior knight told him were still in his head. He said it wasn't a difficult task. The big guy would do all the work, all he had to do was to pull the green lever first and then the red lever second. The senior knight also said that the green lever was linked to the intake valve, 
while an exhaust valve was linked with the red lever so that the steam would pass through the pipe into the cylinder. After the basket was pulled to the mine entrance, he would have to do the reverse if he wanted to stop the machine. First, he had to lift the red lever and then the green lever. With this the steam would be discharged from the side of the boiler. After each cycle, the oven needed be supplemented with water until it was full, although he didn't understand what a valve and a cylinder were, Nils still promised to do everything step by step. However, the senior knight stressed two points that were most important. First, the order could not be wrong. To start the engine, the green lever was first before the red lever. To stop, the green had to be closed after the red. If he made a mistake, it could lead to the destruction of the machine. The second point was that when he was discharging the steam he had to constantly remind the miners to step back until the red lever was completely lifted. The first point Nils had engraved into his head, even with closed eyes he wouldn't make a mistake. But with the second point he had some problems. Today, he was shutting down the machine as usual. He noticed that other miners were no longer around. He felt that he would be a fool if he shouted a warning when no one was around, so he was totally absorbed in pulling the red lever. The red lever was a bit hard to pull, and out of exhaustion he had to bare his teeth during the pull. He hadn't expected Titus to appear in front of the stove when he pulled the lever, Nils hadn't seen him due to the steam engine's big size and because of the loud noise it created, he hadn't even heard the footsteps. The white steam which was exhausted from the boiler directly rushed into Titus' face. Nils was stunned out of fright, he only saw Titus suddenly falling to the ground and rolling around, holding his face and screaming his life out. Titus' screams were so heartbreaking for Nils that they directly attacked the core of his being. Soon, other miners gathered around, opening Titus' hands by force to take a look at his wounds, only to see that his face only vaguely reminded them of a human face. Blood was oozing from his cooked and raw face and his eyes were turned into white pearls. All the people present were sure that Titus couldn't be saved. Nils' soul slowly came back to his body. Titus had always taken care of him, due to his young age, and the work Nils was assigned was less than that of the other people, but the wages Nils got were never less than that of the others. And now, this accident only happened due to his negligence. Between his grief and anxiety, Nils suddenly remembered what the senior knight also said. If one of the miners were accidentally injured, he should be brought to the safe area near the walls. There was a newly opened medical center there. Although Nils knew that such a serious injury was an incurable wound and that the size of the injury was too big, even if herbal medicine could help a little, it couldn't stop the deterioration of Titus' health. Then, Titus would get high fever and would soon fall into a coma. But nonetheless Nils still took Titus into his arms, regardless of the confused looks he got from the nearby people, bit his teeth together, and ran. If he did nothing and Titus died, Nils was afraid that he could never forgive himself for the rest of his life. Chapter 43, Be Strong, Sister Anna. When Nana heard thunderous footsteps coming from the stairs, she ran to the door and took a quick look, but she was soon disappointed because she found out that the person who was coming was His Royal Highness, the Prince. Anna should still be working, but she will probably come by later said Roland when he arrived at Nana's side. Work. Nana had recently often heard this word out of the mouth of the Prince, you mean she is burning this grey mud powder? For now, yes. Nana pouted as she went back to the table. I also have a job, she thought. My job is to stay here and wait to treat the soldiers who are injured while defending the town. Roland asked with a gentle smile, how is it? Do you feel bored when Anna isn't here, as he took a chair to sit by the fireplace? Well, Nana supported her chin with her hand so that she couldn't nod and give a true answer. It wasn't that she didn't want to treat the injured, but, the sight of the injuries was just so horrible. She could still remember when she had to treat Brian, it was the first time she had to treat a human. The man was covered all over in blood that it seemed like he had bathed in blood. A reddish-brown blood clot had solidified in the pit of his stomach, his mouth resembled the look of a dried fish, and he was disgorging white fluids and red blood. Then, Nana had fainted. It was downright disgraceful. Nana raised her head to secretly glance at Roland. She saw that he had leaned back in his chair and was snoring. The prince seemed to be tired, she thought. His jobs were building the walls, training the soldiers, and protecting the town from the invasion of the demonic beasts. When he came to request her help, although she first hesitated for a long time, in the end she did not refuse. You will encounter some things that make you want to live on, even if you will have to struggle to live on. Nana didn't understand what this meant, but when she closed her eyes, 
Anna would appear within her mind, with her pair of bright blue eyes, just like a lake, surrounding her slowly. This was the reason she agreed to Roland's request. She wanted to be as strong as her sister, Anna. Suddenly, footsteps could be heard from downstairs again and Nana immediately jumped off her chair. She wanted to go to the door to see if it was Anna who came this time, but suddenly she was stopped by an invisible hand. Just wait a minute, there is more than one person. Nana patted her chest in dissatisfaction, you scared me, Sister Nightingale. Soon the door was open, and this time it was Brian, who was stationed here, who entered, Miss Pine, please come down. You have a patient who got burned. This was work for her, right? Nana took a deep breath, I will come down. She walked downstairs while two guards were busy with carrying an unconscious person towards a bed. Standing beside the bed was a short man with a face full of anxiety. Brian walked up to the patient and neatly tied the patient's hands and feet to the bed. When he was done tying, he closed up the area with previously prepared curtains and then led the little man out of the room. When Roland came down he asked while rubbing his eyes, what happened? Your Highness, North Slope Mine sent a seriously injured person, he looks like he was scalded. The prince walked over to Brian, he was burned by the steam engine, right? Was there a problem with the engine? Did you send him to Nana? He is in the medical room. Brian pointed to the direction of the door. I need you to look into this case. When he finished speaking, Roland walked towards the medical room. Nana slowly stepped near the injured man, only looking at him carefully within her peripheral vision. When she saw his face, his facial features had turned into paste, forming a round ball. What should have been red skin was dehydrated and inhumanely white, it just looked like a rag was laying on his face. At his neck were blisters as big as small eggs, some of them had even been broken, and the mucus oozing out from the blisters mixed together with the blood in the pillow. In the flickering shine of the fire, his appearance was more horrible than the devil in her nightmares. She took two steps back and closed her eyes. When she opened them again, she saw her father watching her, full of concern. Are you okay? Nana nodded, thinking of the words Roland had told her, you only need to treat the injured the same as you treat the little animals. She once again moved towards the bed and stretched out her hands. An incredible feeling emerged within her body and gathered within the palm of her hand. She saw a ray of light being emitted from the fluorescent green liquid flowing out of her hands as it fell on the injured face. For her, this fluorescence light was obvious, but to others it seemed to be invisible. Then, the wounds began to change. The scorched skin was constantly shed off and new skin began to regrow at a visible speed. The wounded man's groans of pain gradually diminished until it stopped, and his breathing eased. It seemed like he just fell into a deep sleep. Nana exhaled, relieved. This time her own performance was surely better than last time, and she thought, I should have made a great progress with my training, right? My god, is this what his highness meant when he spoke of your healing ability? This is the first time I've seen you do this asked Sir Pine. Then he exclaimed, good girl, you're awesome. It is the power of the gods, Brian said in the same tone of awe, it was also Miss Nana who healed me when I was heavily injured, I really owe her so much. Ah, he is such a fool. Nana had to cover her face because of shame, doesn't he know that it was Sister Nightingale who smuggled him out and saved him on that day? When did that happen? asked Sir Pine, full of wonder, why didn't I know of it? Oh. Their powers have nothing to do with God, they belong to the witches themselves. Roland opened the curtain and stepped inside, coughed once and changed the subject, how are his injures? He has basically recovered, Blaine excitedly said, it's like he was never hurt? Your Highness, with the help of Miss Nana, during the month of the demons, everyone who is fighting has a chance to survive. As long as they don't die on the spot, there will be no problem with saving their lives, the prince confirmed indicating Brian that he should stop since the man woke up, your name is Titus, right? The man who was named Titus had a look full of confusion and asked I, what happened? Am I dreaming? You're not, Roland said, you're still alive, are you? I have seen your highness at the square. The man suddenly woke up like he was hit by lightning, jumped up from the bed, and fell to his knees, your royal highness, was it you who saved me? It was the daughter of the Pine family who saved you, she is a witch and has a healing ability. Nana's mind froze, he directly said that she was a witch, would she be okay? Sure enough, the look in the man's eye changed immediately, a woman, she is a witch? Your highness, aren't they the devils? Don't speak such nonsense. When Serpine heard him speaking such words about his daughter, he angrily cried, 
My daughter has nothing to do with the devil, but she even saved your life instead, man. Do you think the devil would reach out to you with a helping hand? No, no, please forgive me for being impolite, Titus pulled his head immediately into a deep bow, thank you for saving my life, Miss Pine. Nana suddenly felt inexplicably uncomfortable. If she could, she would immediately rush out of the room, but a voice in her mind repeatedly reminded her, be strong. Later when Titus was sent away, Sir Pine worriedly asked, will this really be all right, your highness? In this way, I'm afraid, my daughter will no longer be able to lead a normal life. You have to think on the bright side, Sir Pine, comforted the prince, we have to take advantage in this kind of situation, so that we will be able to break the deadlock. With this, Nana will maybe truly free in the future. Otherwise, in the following years, she will one day be exposed. Until then, I am afraid she can only live a life in seclusion. Real freedom? Nana didn't know what this meant, because even now she felt very free. But his highness said when they would achieve it, Sister Anna would also be able to leave the castle just like herself. Maybe they could even return to Teacher Carl's college, right? Chapter 44, Hidden Answers It was already late when Roland went back to the castle. It was snowing heavily again. He went directly into his bedroom, took off his coat and shook off the snow that got caught in its collar. Then, he hung it on a rack next to the fireplace. Your Highness, don't you think that you have progressed much too quickly? Nightingale's voice came out of nowhere, and then she became visible to the prince. You mean the situation with Nana? Roland poured each of them a glass of wine. Although the wine was more bitter than he was used to, slowly he had become used to its taste. Nightingale took the cup offered by the prince but did not drink, she was waiting for the prince to give a longer answer. There will never be a more appropriate time than now, said Roland. He drank his cup of wine all at once, only to fill it up once more afterwards. I plan to let Nana play a big role with her ability during the months of the demons. So, it would have been impossible impossible to conceal her identity as a witch anyway. She can instantly cure fatal injuries? This is nothing close to what ordinary herbs or bloodletting can do, everyone will want this. Border town is in the most western part of the kingdom. Here, so far away the center, the church's influence is very limited, if I were them, I wouldn't be willing to spend so many gold royals for a place which could be abandoned at any time. Roland continued, we even don't have a small town church. The missionary left with the nobility to Longsong stronghold earlier. Knowing all this, what do you think border town is? It is an island, totally cut off from the outside world. This was your plan since the beginning, asked Nightingale, surprised. Roland nodded, the never-ending snowfall will close the road to Longsong stronghold, and the entire town will be in my hands. We have at least three months to reverse the which is our evil point of view. With only mouth-to-mouth -mouth propaganda, the effect will be very limited. So, we must rely on real-life experiences in order to quickly eliminate the hatred caused by ignorance and misunderstanding. That was the reason why he wanted to let everyone think Nana was the cause of Brian's rescue. He wanted to create a different image of Nightingale. There existed a legend of a nurse who made an all-out effort to look after wounded people, resulting in the plummet of the wounded mortality rate, from 42% to 2%. Thus, the fighters conferred her the title of Lady with the Lamp, and the popularity of the whole nurse profession had been elevated to the rank of worship. Nana's ability to heal had more to offer than only heal the injured, as long as someone didn't die on the spot, she could restore him completely like he was never injured. This would be more important and boost the morale more than any weapon upgrade he had presented. At the same time, thanks to her family's decline within the aristocracy's ranks, her father had to deal with hunters and farmers often during the weekdays. Because of this, he had a very calm and kind attitude towards the normal civilians, and he even allowed Nana to visit Carl's collage and learn with them. This kind of act was absolutely unthinkable for even the lowest of barons, they would never agree if their children had something to do with the peasants, in their eyes, these people were the so-called untouchables. This, can we really do this? Even Nightingale, when facing such a big monster like the church, felt extraordinarily small and weak. If we never try to change, we will never know the answer. Roland did not expect that he would be able to change the view of all the inhabitants of Border Town, but he at least hoped to plant seeds within the hearts of some and get a small team of supporters. Later, he wanted to relay on the seeds, to let them grow and let them spread. Within three months, many changes could be achieved. 
Nightingale thought about it and then whispered, why do you want to step out of the masses and help us witches? In order to use their power for the production of resources, make himself more powerful, and have a better chance in winning the throne, of course, all these answers were not suitable to say aloud. Even so, Roland was a mechanical engineer, he had played a good variety dating games, so he could even be seen as a veteran who knew a lot. So with the experience of having lived for more than 40 years in two different worlds he knew that this time he had to face a crucial question and give the right answer. So he thought carefully about his next words and said slowly, I haven't told you yet, but I do not care about the background of any inhabitant of border town. I hope that one day, in my territory, even witches can live a life as free as any other person. This time Nightingale was silent for a long time, and the only sound left was the crackling of the burning firewood. Her face, highlighted by the flickering flames, was like an otherworldly picture. When she spoke again, Roland had enough time to free himself from the beautiful illusion. You really don't have to accomplish all this. Her voice was small but gentle, please forgive me for lying to you before. My sisters in the Witch Cooperation Association have been living the life of refugees for far too long. They do not expect so much, their only goal is to have a place where they can live in seclusion. Even living in this castle would be enough. How would that be different from living your life within a cage? Roland shook his head, but then he suddenly come to an understanding. His eyes became wide open when he looked full of shock at Nightingale, what do you mean? Are you saying that you are willing to bring your sisters back here? Nightingale sighed and avoided looking directly at the prince, when I do this, you will become the enemy of the church. Their arm has been stretched too far and has become too thin. Roland didn't mind the future road, do the slogan the power of the king is granted by the god, the church, and the mortal power will conflict sooner or later. As for border town, we only have to live through the next months, then they will not be able to do much to us. Here we are thousands of miles away from their seat of power. What do you think will happen when the bishop of Longsong stronghold holds a military trial to come to crusade me? My father would never allow this to happen, this would be a much too great of an attack against his royal power. Nightingale didn't know how to answer, she gave him her salute and left. When Nightingale was out of the room, Roland let himself fall onto the bed, and took in a deep breath to relax. There were some things he didn't tell her. For example he didn't tell her that the center of the church's power was a thousand miles away. In accordance with the world's news circulation speed, they would probably only be able to react in late spring. In addition to the distance there was also his identity as a prince, so a big possibility would be that they would only send envoys to ascertain the situation. As a result, Roland thought that they would only arrive after half a year. By then, he himself would already have a solution to break their strength. Thus, the biggest risk of his plan wasn't the church, but rather the witches themselves. This point was only known by himself. Although at the moment the witches were at a disadvantage, the current situation would not last forever. The power of the witch did not rely on blood heritage, so there was no pattern to who would awaken, it was all random. This meant that they could not be eradicated, so their number could only increase. The church relies on their god's eye of retribution, and for the moment they can still maintain their advantages over the witches with it, but it can only offset their magic. However, the witch awakening not only gives them a wide range of ability, but also boosts their physical power and mental reaction speed. Even their appearances would become more beautiful than ordinary people. They essentially could be regarded as a new mankind. The more brutal the oppression becomes, the more intense the resistance will be. How much damage would be caused to Grey Castle if the witches started and lead a riot? Because the church gave birth to the hatred, once they lost control, it would be likely that the hatred would turn against all the residents of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. Roland didn't want to see that happen. So, he needed to start from Border Town, and lay down the structure to contain both sides. Later, he would need to extend the structure to Longsong Stronghold, and in the end to the whole kingdom. He was creating a world in which common people and witches could coexist. Chapter 45, Conspiracy, Part 1 During the night of the new moon, the silhouette of Gerald Wimbledon could be seen near the walls of the city of Grey Castle. After his few months of stationing at Hermes came to an end, he was now finally back, he thought. The long journey left him totally exhausted, but he was still vigilant of his surroundings. He reined his horse to stop and motioned his deputy to go and inquire about the situation. If everything went as planned, the scholar Anster should have had all of the guards replaced with guards loyal to Gerald. 
when his deputy gave the signal, the replaced guards would let down the side door of the drawbridge. Gerald was wide-eyed, and was staring forward, out of fear that the guards would overlook the signal. The truth was that he hadn't waited very long, but for Gerald it felt like time froze and he had to wait forever. When his eyes had already ached to their breaking point, he finally saw a short flicker in the distance, two short flickers at the bottom of the wall, and then three times above the wall as the answer, signaling that everything was going as planned. Gerald had to take a deep breath before giving his troops the signal to march forward. Seeing this, he already believed himself to be only a step away from the throne. Gerald rode shoulder to shoulder with his deputies through the side door in the wall. Behind him were more than 20 men of his cavalry following him. No one spoke a word, the only sound which could be heard was the pulling of the reins to move the horses slowly forward. The walls of the city were built out of stones from the fallen Dragon Mountain. Under the illumination of the torches, the brown and dark red stones made the wall look like it was overflowing with blood. The entire wall was 20 feet wide, and during the construction of the biggest wall in the world at that time, more than a thousand hard laborers, masons, and slaves had to die. In the minds of the people this city was known as an impregnable fortress, but now Gerald and his men were easily crossing the walls, conquering the city with units from within. Somehow, he had to think of the church's new holy city, would their more ambitious and absolutely impregnable walls also fall due treachery from within? Your Highness, I have already waited a long time for you here. Gerald could hear Anster's voice through the gates. There, the scholar was already waiting for him with a small troop. Seeing Gerald appear, Anster quickly dismounted and bent down to bow. Gerald pushed his distracting thoughts aside. He was probably too excited, making it impossible for him to restrain his emotions, but he let his imagination run wild, you have done well. Did you also replace all the palace guards? I was going to, but then an unexpected problem appeared in the plan. Your silver knight who had already agreed to help was unexpectedly transferred to the south exit three days ago. Until now, we haven't had time to switch the new guards with our guards. Gerald frowned, this meant that he could not take 20 soldiers with him into the palace. Gerald himself wouldn't be stopped, but the guards would never let this many armed people into the royal palace. Let it pass, split the team into two parts and come with me to the palace door. Keep the door under good guard and don't let any outsiders hinder me on my way, he hesitated for a moment to make up his mind. Although the plan had changed, the situation was still under his control. Naturally at night, guards would stand outside his father's chamber, but as long as someone could distract them for a moment, he was sure to cut them down with his sword. Inside the city, everything looked the same as it had been when he left. Although he was now walking through the city at night, he was still able to recognize every street. This was his territory, there existed no doubt. Everyone jumped off their horses and marched rapidly forward in the direction of the palace. When they arrived at the door, his more than 20 soldiers spread out according to the new plan, lurking outside the palace. It was just like Anster had said, except the guards were surprised as to why the prince wanted to speak with the king so late at night. However, after hearing Gerald's bluff about having to discuss important matters, they directly opened the door and let him enter. After all, he was the eldest son of the king and the first heir to the throne. Anster and Gerald went together through the garden and the halls of the palace. In front of the palace was the residence of Wimbledon III. Anster raised his torch and waved side to side with it. Immediately after that, a guard appeared out of the shadows and knelt on one knee, pleading, Your Highness, please come with me. Gerald became irritated, he smelled blood. Didn't Anster say that they had replaced all the palace guards? He looked through the shadows of the flames and took a good view at the man, he was indeed a familiar person, a knight who supported Gerald in the fight for the throne. This gave him a little peace of mind. What happened, had someone entered the castle? It happened earlier this evening, your royal highness. His majesty had summoned a maid for this evening, but she came exactly at the moment of the changing of the guards the other replied, please be assured that we have handled the situation well. He summoned a maid? His father had not touched a woman for a long time, since the death of his mother. Gerald was a little surprised, but now he had not the time to entangle himself in such a trivial matter. So, he nodded and said nothing more about it, and instead went into the castle, followed by his guards. Even with his eyes closed, Gerald could find his way through the castle. He had lived here for more than 20 years. Where there was a secret passage, where there was a secret door, everything was crystal clear for him. 
However, the purpose of this trip was to persuade his father to pat the throne to him without bloodshed. So surreptitiously sneaking into the palace was meaningless, he had to get rid of the guards stationed outside of his father's chamber. Then, he could let his father fully understand his situation, so that they could sit down and talk seriously about the ownership of the right to inheritance. If he could not convince him, Gerald Wimbledon took a deep breath and gave a hand signal for his followers to stop, then pulled out his large sword and took it in his hands. At the end of the corridor was a bronze door, which was the only entrance into the palace. The door to the bedroom was at the end of the corridor behind the bronze door. Usually two or three guards would be stationed here, but this would be the first time in the history of the palace that the entrance to the king's bedchamber would be unprotected. Gerald first opened the door enough only for small slit, then he slid in with the side of his shoulder, quickly entering the room and taking a battle-ready position with his sword, but inside the room it was totally quiet, and there was nobody speaking. At the same time, an intense smell of blood entered his nose. The thought of premonition flashed through his mind. Then, he directly ran towards his father's chambers. There, Gerald saw a staggering scene. His father Wimbledon III was sitting in his bed only wearing his nightgown, and his upper body was leaning on a pillow. His robe was open, and in his chest stuck the hilt of a sword. Blood trickled down his belly and soaked the quilt. Standing beside his father was actually his brother, Timothy Wimbledon. How? How is this possible? Gerald stood in place, totally startled. Just like you, brother, Timothy sighed, I really didn't want to do it. He clapped his hands, and a large number of armored soldiers rapidly entered the room, surrounding Gerald. This was a chess game and I wanted to finish it in accordance with the rules. Brother, do you know why I couldn't? If you have to blame someone, blame third sister. From the beginning she didn't intend to follow the rules, but of course, you did. Otherwise, why would you rush back to the king's city after hearing scholar Anstjur's prediction? Seriously, if you didn't come, I really would have been helpless. Anstjur. Gerald grit his teeth and looked at Anstjur, enraged. Out of fear, scholar Anstjur stepped backwards. While raising his hands he said, I didn't lie to you when I said the star of apocalypse has begun its arrival. It metaphorically hunts everyone who has stepped away from the right path, but it also has the meaning of downfall. Gerald now fully understood. From the beginning, he had fallen into a well-designed trap. The smell of blood in front of the castle was probably not left by a maid, but instead it was his silver knight who was removed instead of transferred like they had said. However, his biggest point of despair was that scholar Anstjur, who had taken care of him for longer than a decade and had taught him how to read and write, had chosen the second prince in the end, just like his father. Timothy Wimbledon, he was a son like Gerald himself, but Timothy alone got all the attention of their father. He got the best territory allocated to him, so it was totally unexpected that he would be the one to strike first. You're the devil from hell. For a short moment, anger flashed within Timothy's eyes, but it soon disappeared do you really think so? Dear brother, if you were unable to change our father's choice, did you really intend to stop there and go back? Do not cheat yourself. Chapter 46, Conspiracy, Part 2 Gerald didn't know how to reply. The only thing left for him to do was to drag his own brother to hell with him. However, after some time he calmed down and asked, Do you think you can get rid of me by telling your lies? Get rid of you? No, that wouldn't help me at all dear brother. I was helpless, I had to do it. Timothy's tone remained calm, as if he was only stating facts, if I had honored father and waited five years, I was afraid that I would have had to face third sister's pirate fleet. You know what she has been doing recently, right? Gerald shook his head and felt a stabbing pain within his heart when he realized how great the distance between himself and second brother had become. He remembered that his brother was very clever from an early age but wasn't good at riding, shooting or fighting. As long as he had an opportunity to deliver a slash to Timothy, he could behead him, she set up her own army, brother. Really, I admire her. She had even begun to organize it before father gave the order to fight for the throne, this was something even I didn't expect. We got along so harmoniously during our childhood, so how could it have developed like this? Why do we have to kill each other for the throne? Then, he took a step towards Gerald and asked, take yourself for example. I'm afraid that you now want to split me in half with your sword, right? I know you do, brother, since you told me before that when you want to kill you get a frightening look in your eyes. Timothy sighed, I will bluntly tell you, I had to end this fight for the throne beforehand. 
Otherwise, if I had waited for five years I would have had to face Garcia's fleet. She has already controlled Clearwater for several years, and has made it a city suitable to handle business and the recruitment of soldiers unlike Valencia, the city of Golden Harvest, which is only good for business and not suitable for rearing soldiers. I need an army strong enough to withstand Third Sister's fleet, which isn't something I can achieve when I can only depend on a trading city. Gerald Wimbledon, tomorrow you will be sentenced to trial because of the assassination of the king and your absence from your territory. I, on the other hand, will travel back to Valencia during the night so that I will be there before the news of father's death spreads. I'll be deeply heartbroken, and will accept the throne only because I, as the second prince, am the duty-bound inheritor. Anyway, I will become the king while you will be sentenced to death by the guillotine. You. Gerald roared, enraged, and attacked his brother. However, the distance between him and Timothy was too far, so his sword was intercepted by two knights who then slashed at him in return, and a sword pierced his calf. Gerald lost his balance due the sudden injury and fell on the ground. The guards tightly swarmed around him and pinned him to the ground so that he could not move. You want to hold a trial? Do you think so lowly of me? I will tell everyone about what happened? I will let all people know what kind of monster you are. Of course I will not allow you to do that, brother, Timothy patiently declared. The alchemic workshop has invented a drug named Forgotten Language, it uses the modulated poison of the sand lizard from the southern border and is mixed together with milk. After drinking it, you won't be able to emit any sound. Rest assured, you won't feel any pain, but the flavor is mellow and it's befuddling. If you have to blame someone, then blame our third sister, the genius. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be forced to do this. Timothy waved his hand towards the knight commander who gave his salute and lead Gerald out of the palace. The other guards also left so that the last remaining people were Scholar Anstger and Timothy. Your Highness, since your taking over the throne is already settled, I will call you your majesty from now on, said Anstger as he bent down. You have done well. When I sit on the throne of Grey Castle, I will honor our agreement, but, but after I saw how miserable my brother was today, I think some provisions should be added to our agreement to ensure my safety. The scholar's look changed immediately, your majesty, you mean dash. Rest assured, I just do not want to be betrayed. Timothy pulled a small pill from his pocket, this must have been so much for you to handle. Maybe you should take this pill, it will dissolve after seven days. This should be enough time for me to travel to Valencia, getting the sad news and then to travel back to Grey Castle. Later, when I become king, you will become the chief astrologer like we had agreed but I do not want the others to offer you a higher price. Your Majesty. You have to be joking, Scholar Anstger's face became pale and his look became pained. But in the end, he grit his teeth, and eventually swallowed the pill. Smart choice said Timothy as he nodded with satisfaction, you may go. When the palace was deserted, the prince's face darkened. He grabbed the porcelain that was placed on a small table beside the bed. Several sounds of porcelain shattering could be heard. So, the guards who were stationed outside immediately rushed in. Your Highness, get out. He shouted. Yes, the guards quickly lowered their heads and went out, closing the door behind them. Damn, this wasn't how I had planned it. Timothy hadn't planned to kill his father. With Wimbledon III's favor, he only wanted his father to take notice of Garcia's actions and stop her. His older brother Prince Gerald, on the other hand, would be a pawn within Timothy's hand. Timothy had thought that this plan couldn't go wrong. By controlling Gerald's mentor, scholar Anstger, Timothy could manipulate his brother from the dark, within the Astrologer's Association, scholar Anstger's status wasn't high, but when Anstger wrote some letters to Gerald, the first prince was quickly hooked. All this went exactly like Timothy had planned. His elder brother was strong in battle but he wasn't good at thinking, but he still wasn't willing to hand over the throne. With each letter they exchanged, Scholar Anstger would increase the ambitions of Gerald, guiding him along the path Timothy had prepared. When the last letter with the astrological predictions was sent, Timothy secretly returned to the side of the king, informing him that the first prince may come to pressure him into abdicating the throne. There was no doubt that once this matter was confirmed, the king would immediately imprison the prince out of rage or even sentence him to death or exile instead. Then, King Wimbledon would have to focus on his other children, and when he saw that Garcia was actively developing her military forces, she would inevitably become a second eyesore for him. But, who could have thought that when Timothy had revealed the news, the king would only smile, 
pull out his personal dagger and directly stab himself in his chest? Everything happened so quickly that Timothy had no chance to intervene, he could only watch his father die. He slowly sat down beside the bed. In the first moments after the incident he thought that this was all an illusion. His father's final smile was just like a nightmare, causing his hair to stand on end. Timothy went through the whole thing over and over again, even inspecting his father's body, but he still couldn't find a single clue as to why his father had killed himself. He also thought about the idea that it was simply a double, but he couldn't find any flaws in the situation in front of him. Even the remnants of his father's old wounds were exactly the same as he remembered. Seeing that Gerald had arrived to meet the king, he calmed down. With this he could push the blame for King Wimbledon III's death onto the first prince, and then he could use his own identity as the second prince to inherit the throne. After a smooth coronation, he would no longer be restricted to his own territory. Then, he could mobilize forces throughout the whole kingdom to pressure Garcia, forcing her to give up the harbor of clear water. It seemed that the ending was better than it could have been, but Timothy still felt deeply uneasy, as if he was led by an invisible hand, who was already able to control the war of Greycastle's upper nobility, but Timothy himself knew nothing about it. However, at the moment he could do nothing else besides claiming the throne, so he had no choice. Timothy Wimbledon swore to himself that if he ever found out who was the cause, he would let them know what happened when they angered a king. Chapter 47, Market Circulation For the last week, it was fairly calm for Border Town. Iron Axe and Brian both said that the strength and number of the demonic beasts would gradually grow with the progression of the months of the demons. So, taking advantage of the situation where the pressure on the line of defense wasn't strong yet, Roland once again sent a boat with ore to Willow Town. Since the steam engine was put into use for mining in the North Slope mine, the number of miners had been reduced by half, but the production had steadily improved. Now, it had been restored to the level of production from before the collapse. Using a machine to do the job saved a lot of manpower. Meanwhile, under Roland's orders the mine production systems had undergone a preliminary reform. The former fixed payment for each day was changed into a variable pay. He let Barav put together a statistic about last year's average amount of ore produced daily. With this he could set a standard and everyone who mined more could increase their pay. An increased number of gemstones would result in a big reward. This move effectively increased the workers' enthusiasm for mining, so the mine became a bustling area. Roland naturally wanted to do more with his ore, now that he had more ore in hand. In addition to the plan to put a second steam engine into production, he also intended to manufacture a number of manual lathes. This lathe can be seen as something historical, it was commonly seen as an essential machine for implementing other tools. The anvil can be regarded as the most primitive tool, it was used for manual fixing and creating. It was better used to create, because using it to fix was really too inconvenient, thereupon people would often try to fasten their product or place it in a recess on a table to fix their processed parts. For example, the early matchlock and flintlock gun barrels were placed into a recess on the anvil to be pounded out by hand. Later, manual creation became too slow to meet demand, so they needed tools to increase production speed. The lathe could be used according to different purposes, the tools could be fixed according to each need, and the manual and machine processing could be used together. So, the lathe could effectively improve the strength of pure manual labor and could be changed for every weak point. Roland also considered a manual milling machine. Although the milling machine had various functions, he wanted to mainly use it in order to process involute gears, so its architecture could also be simplified correspondingly. With a slot for a fixed tooth plate and a rotatable steel disc, customized cutting gear could be easily manufactured with Anna's help, by grinding off and polishing the top layer after it got heated to a red-hot state, erasing the slag on the iron, and then immersing it water to harden it it would become a highly rigid custom disc. After the key problems were solved, Roland immediately gave Carter the order to hire two carpenters, who would build him a milling machine. Meanwhile, Anna continued to manufacture other metal parts in the castle backyard. Roland had to say, that with Anna's help, metal processing had become as easy as forming clay, especially after she had mastered the retrieval of her flame. At the moment she was pre-treating small items, forming their rough shapes within her hands. Seeing Anna take an iron ingot in her hand, melt it without further help and shape it into the form she wanted caused Roland to sigh in wonder. If he hadn't been able to employ a witch, Roland thought, 
achieving his production program would be delayed by more than a decade. Two days later, the first simple milling machine appeared in the backyard. This time Roland wasn't idle, drawing the gears could be regarded as his job. He designed a set of gears to be used for speed control and stabilizing the steam output. The corresponding tooth plate's design was already normed, and Roland could only wait until the milling machine was completely assembled before they could start with the production of the gears. Using gears wasn't a new thing, most of the mines in this world used a winch mechanism to drain the water, which was built out of wooden gears and pulled by animals. The chief knight finally felt satisfied, last time, his highness had done so many unfathomable things, but this time he could understand what the prince tried to achieve. Roland also gathered three blacksmiths with their apprentices, who would learn how to use the milling machine together. After all, he could not personally operate the machine every day, so it was necessary to train a group of professional workers. After everyone respectfully bowed, Roland began to demonstrate how to use the milling machine to process the gears. Roland didn't mind acting as a teacher in front of everyone. In fact, what else could one do in this era? Plus, while doing this, there was no one who could criticize his manners, so he could operate the machine without any pressure. The chief knight was in charge of pouring hot lard into the machine as lubrication, naturally in this age there were no oil lubricants. Replacing it with lard was a bit of a waste, but it was still better than nothing. After drenching the disc, the lard would fall into a pot which was placed under the machine. With this, the lard could be reused several times. Roland first placed the lower milling stone in accordance with the design he had engraved beforehand. Then, he set the tooth gear above it so that the tooth gear, the milling stone, and a wooden wheel were in one line. The wooden wheel was driven by a pedal and its power was transmitted to the lower millstone by a leather belt. Then, he put his hands down to gently stabilize the disc handle, until the lower millstone and the slowly moving tooth gear were at a 90 degrees angle. Because the material of the tooth disc was iron and the lower millstone was out of steel, cutting out the teeth marks was not very difficult. Due to the hot lard the yard was soon filled with a tasty smell, but because the blacksmiths and their apprentices hadn't had meat in a long time, they had to swallow their saliva when smelling it. After the demonstration, the contract was soon signed. Border Town's commerce was still in the initial phase, but calling it an industry was out of the question. No matter if it were the steam engine or the lathe, there would be no phenomenon where the people would run to the store, striving to be first or fearing to be the last to buy them. In this day and age, most people were not aware of the enormous significance they represented, as well as the potential commercial value they possessed. As such, Roland could only take the initiative to promote the use of these machines. Roland specifically wrote in the contract that the blacksmiths who used the milling machine were required to process at least one set of gears each week. The required materials would be provided by the castle and the processing cost was set at 10 silver royals. At the same time, the blacksmiths had to pay a weekly fee of two gold royals. The milling machine was not given to them for use free of charge, but was rented out to them instead. After entering the months of the demons, the blacksmiths would usually have a lot less to do. So, this time when they had the chance to make money and it was even under an order from his highness, there was naturally no blacksmith who had any objections. Meanwhile, Roland told them that this was only the first milling machine. In the future he would produce several, one after another, and if they were interested in one, they could apply for it in the town hall. Your Highness, why didn't you directly write a processing fee of eight silver royals in the contract, asked Carter, puzzled, after the blacksmiths had left the backyard. Although these two figures are the same, they don't contain the same meaning, Roland explained, this is probably Border Town's first commercial leasing contract, so I had to set an industry norm. The chief knight rubbed his forehead. The fourth prince seemed to be talking rubbish once more, but Carter was already used to it. As long as he pretended to listen carefully, his highness would continue to explain it. A good beginning is always important in order to form a virtuous circle. I am the only one who currently needs to buy the gears, so I have to provide the tools while they provide the manpower. They will also get paid. In the future when there are others who have a demand for gears, they will realize that having their own tools will be better than renting the machine and earning the remuneration provided. When Roland spoke up to here, he paused for a moment and then said, in this way, when they see something new, they can first rent the machine and decide later if the market is big enough for buying their own machine, and if not they will just continue renting the machine. This is a virtuous circle. Chapter 48, Assembly. 
While Roland, full of interest, was talking about implementing a fair trading system, the sound of distant horns could be heard. The patrol team would only blow the horn in the case that they couldn't cope with the current situation, alerting the town to assemble soldiers. Roland and Carter looked at each other surprised, and then immediately walked out of the castle backyard, where the guards already had already prepared horses. Roland directly mounted his horse and rode with Carter and his men in the direction of the walls. When they arrived at the wall, they saw that all members of the militia had already climbed up the wall and had taken their places, setting up a forest of pikes. Seeing this gave Roland a feeling of relief, the eggs hadn't been a waste after all. Looking northwest, Roland could see a group of black shadows approaching border town. He reckoned that their numbers were over 20. Iron Axe left his defending position and trotted over. After giving a salute he said, Your Highness, this group of demonic beasts nearing us seem to be slightly strange. Strange? Are you saying that they would normally not act as a group? That's not it, Iron Axe explained, if they were to pack animals before the fall, then they would still retain that habit, such as the wolf species. But this kind of species doesn't belong to this kind, they normally wouldn't act this way, they seem to be on a mission. Earlier the hunters had already seen the beasts killing each other. The demonic beasts were only a mutation of their former kind, their actions would mostly be similar to their original habits, but at the same time their desires would become stronger. In a sense, the intelligence of a demonic beast was lower than that of a wild animal, because of their manic temper they even crossed dangerous areas that they would normally never cross. Roland carefully observed the group of demonic beasts. He could see really big and small beasts and could distinguish at least two different kind of beasts, one kind wolf and the other bison. Species which would normally kill each other had suddenly learned that they had to work together to accomplish something. Because they still had to pass through some obstacles and traps set up by Iron Axe, they slowly crowded together in front of the center of the city wall. Banner felt his hands become damp with sweat, his grip holding the pike had become somewhat slippery. Taking advantage of the fact that no one was looking at him, he secretly wiped his hands on his clothes. The hunter captain repeatedly said, you have to relax, take deep breaths. Vanner repeatedly tried to do this but still could not stop his accelerated heartbeat. He had already lived in the West for more than a decade, and he had always heard of the evil doings of the demonic beasts. Since the beginning of the months of the demons, the occasionally arriving demonic beasts were all shot down by the hunter squads, so he slowly lost his fear of the demonic beasts. He even thought of himself as a brave and battle-hardened soldier, but today, Facing so many demonic beasts for the first time, Vanner's legs still trembled. He reminded himself that he was chosen by his highness as a vice-captain, so Vanner tried to show a calm appearance, and kept the defense position. The group of demonic beasts was now close enough that he could make out their appearances. Running in the front was one demonic beast of the bison species. On its head it had two arm-thick horns, it looked just like a black ram. The hair growing on its back seemed to cover it tightly like a cloak. When it was only 30 feet away from the wall, Vanner could feel the ground trembling. He licked his dry lips, and waited for the captain to issue the command to thrust. Then a loud bang could be heard. The bison demonic beast actually didn't reduce its speed, but hit its head straight against the wall, totally crushing its head and splashing black blood everywhere, painting the wall black. Vanner didn't even have the time to breathe, the bison was immediately followed by two wolves which jumped up off of the dead bison's back thrust out. Hearing the captain's command, Vanner subconsciously thrust out with his pike, even though the wolf species wasn't rushing toward him. The effect of this thrust was clearly not as good as their thrusts during their training. Some thrust their pikes many times in succession, and some people who saw the wolves jump thrust their pikes only once, while others did not react for a long time even after hearing the command. As a result, only one wolf was driven back and the other jumped through a gap in the pike forest and landed on the wall. Keep the formation, yelled the captain once more. Although Vanner would have liked to turn into a bird and look at the situation where the wolf had jumped on the wall, Iron Axe had emphasized many times during their training that when something broke through and came behind the front row, taking their attention, the front would turn into the most dangerous area. So he stared straight at the next group of attacking beasts with his eyes, and gripped the pike as strongly as he could. The elite hunter squad was clearly better trained than the normal militia. Even before the wolf had landed, the hunters had already pulled out their cutlasses. Iron Axe was the quickest of all. He jumped directly in front of the wolf, 
only one step away, raised the butt of his gun, and firmly smashed it on the wolf's waist, hitting the wolf when it was still in the air so that it span many times in the air. Whether it was the strength or the defense, after the demonic beast's mutation both were significantly improved. Such an attack clearly had not caused too much damage to it. The wolf could still stand up immediately after its crash, and bare its sharp teeth. Unfortunately for the wolf, Iron Axe's muzzle had already arrived at its head. Bang! The demonic beast's skull exploded and its brain matter flew everywhere. Without its brain, the wolf took one frail step backwards and collapsed while twitching. The beast is dead, continue to hold your positions. My stomach a dash. Someone loudly screamed in despair. Vanner could see it in his peripheral vision. He saw a comrade leaning against the wall, tightly clutching his stomach, with blood-stained hands. His intestines are flowing out. The other wolf had rushed the wall up again and had clawed directly at him. Help me. Damn, someone take out some cloth to press down on the wound. It was a chaotic scene, other demonic beasts, like a wild boar, also rushed towards the wall. Despite its rough skin and flesh, the boar was so close that it had become a hedgehog due to the crossbow arrows shot by the hunters. Everybody don't panic. Roland thought, if Nightingale were here, she could have saved them from some trouble. Then he shouted, have you already forgotten what you learned during your training? How do you treat injured people? Handle it according the regulations. Hearing the prince's shout, Vanner immediately woke up and remembered his duty. As a vice captain responsible for a segment of the wall's defense he was responsible for organizing a rescue whenever someone was injured. He ordered two of his subordinates, you two, hurry and carry him towards the medical center, quickly. According to their previous experiences, the subordinates believed that this person would not survive. However, his royal highness had once said, it's one thing to do something and not be successful, but doing nothing is forbidden. As a vice captain of the militia, Vanner needed to give priority to the implementation of orders and regulations. When the wounded comrade was carried away, order was finally restored on the wall. This wave of demonic beasts was seemingly large, but only a few could threaten the members of the militia on the wall. The hunters shot the rest of the demonic beasts down one by one. Seeing this, Vanner could finally breathe relieved. Even though the whole battle had only lasted half an hour, he felt empty, and had no strength left. However, at this moment, the person responsible for lookout of the demonic beasts shouted again, my god, what is that? Vanner could also see the new beasts. Although it was still a long distance away from the wall, its outline was still clearly visible. This beast was really a monster. Vanner swore, even if ten oxen were piled up in front of this monster, they couldn't compare. Only the experienced Iron Axe could immediately identify the newcomer. He had to take a deep breath to calm himself down. There was no doubt that this was a hybrid species, the militia was in trouble. Chapter 49, Mixed Species Roland rubbed his eyes in disbelief, what the hell was this? Was this still within the scope of the biological variability of a demonic beast? What he saw was hard to describe with words, even monsters in horror films were not this absurd. From afar, it looked like a giant turtle with two heads, but from close up, it was actually two wolf heads. Roland thought, was this a test specimen from Dr. Frankenstein? It was almost as tall as the city walls, its body was seven yards long, and it had a total of six legs which were stumpy and shaped like a rhinoceros legs. However, one foot was the size of at least one adult torso. The head, unlike the two-headed monsters in various monster films, they weren't yelling at each other, biting each other, or trying to show who was the boss. Instead, they were just hanging down, and their eyes had a wooden glaze. It was like a zombie which was brainlessly moving forward. However, the demonic beast's most striking feature was the shell on its back. The shell's surface was dark brown and covered with algae, and it had a special hardness. It was just like a turtle shell, covering the turtle from the front to the back. If this monster could also shrink back into its shell like a turtle, it would be really hard to get rid of it. However, Roland didn't worry, a demonic beast this big had to be slow, so it was destined to be a target. Even if the firearms couldn't penetrate its shell, it was still possible to shoot the heads that were sticking out. If it intended to hide in its shell, then they would have to turn it upside down with explosives. Your Highness, this is a hybrid species, Iron Axe nervously leaned over and explained, now I can understand why the demonic beasts of different species work together. They seem to be under the control of the hybrid demonic beast. So it was like a lion which commanded sheep? 
Roland nodded. So this is a completely different beast than the one you met last time. It is also my first time seeing this kind of hybrid species. Although it looks bizarre, you can't get careless. As long as it's a mixed species, it will always be hard to deal with it. It will soon enter the range of our archers, so try to first kill it with bows and crossbows ordered Roland. At this moment, since it was still lightly snowing and a strong wind was blowing from the north, the weather wasn't suitable for archery. However, two hunters of Iron Axe's personal squad were still confident that they could kill the beast. They climbed up the watchtower, tested the wind and then fired their arrows into the air. The two arrows seemed like they had grown eyes. They rose to the highest point and then, under the influence of wind and gravity, fell at an almost vertical angle onto their target. Just as envisioned, the arrows bounced off the shell. In Roland's brain it even sounded like a ricochet. Seeing this, the hunters hurriedly inserted their next arrow on their strings, and let loose a second wave. Finally, this volley received a result. This time, the impact area was in the front part of the monster, so one arrow precisely entered into the head of a wolf while the other arrow was entered the neck of the other head. However, the demonic beasts didn't roar in anger or speed up its charge, it just stopped for a short pause, tucked its head into its shell and then continued to slowly move forward. This change left everyone stunned. With this the demonic beasts just looked like a tank, its body was as low as possible above the ground so that even a better shooter wouldn't be able to land an arrow. Take your guns, Roland ordered. Now, the target was only 50 feet away from the wall. Even if the guns weren't carved rifled flintlocks, he didn't worry that they would miss. Carter and Iron Axe immediately went near the edge of the wall, laid the barrels of their guns on the horizontal frame of the wall, aimed, and fired. While a burst of white smoke was drifting away from the rifles, Roland could clearly see the bullet hitting the shell and splitting away some debris, even opening a small hole within the shell. However, the mixed species seemed to be unaffected, as it continued to maintain its original speed. It seemed that this layer of armor belonged to the strength category of biological carbon's intensity, thought Roland. Unfortunately, the lead balls were still too soft, so they were easily deformed and were not suitable to penetrate thick armor. So, those four rifles alone to break the mixed species armor was quite unrealistic, so the only option left was to use explosives. Iron Axe agreed with the prince's judgment, he immediately ordered his deputy to get the explosives as fast as possible, because the demonic beast had already reached the walls. They didn't feel the earth tremble like it did when the demonic beast stumped toward the wall. Instead, it unexpectedly began to smash its shell against the wall again and again, just like a high-frequency rotary hammer. Suddenly, stone chips began to fly everywhere and a number of cracks spread along the bound cement at a rapid speed. Rough walls were highly resistant to compression, but the tensile and shear resistance performance of the walls were very poor. That meant that the wall's ability to withstand the shock of vibration was almost zero. The people standing on the walls could feel a strong vibration, and soon, a shrill sound of friction was delivered to the ears of all the people standing on the wall. With this, the wall had begun to give up under the mixed species attack. However, its impact hadn't stopped. Instead, it started to move again, and soon the whole front half of the beast's body was embedded into the walls. The militia standing on the part of the wall with the cracks had already fled, and the invisible nightingale grabbed Roland by his waist and jumped down with him from the top of the wall, if at this moment someone was staring at the prince, he would see the prince's feet hanging above the floor, just like a ghost. When Vanner arrived carefully carrying a package of explosives, he was surprised to see that there was already a nine-foot-wide hole within the wall, and the demonic beast had already stepped through the wall but was still maintaining its previous speed of slowly moving forwards. Hurry! Iron Axe shouted, light it and put it at the foot of the demonic beast. Although Vanner's hand were shaking, his mind unexpectedly became clear and every detail of his training with the explosives emerged within his mind. It was a different version of explosives than used during the training. To reduce costs, the explosive was now placed inside a wooden box filled with debris from the mine. At the same time, the ignition design was also optimized, it used a flint and copper wire type ignition. If this failed, the kit also contained normal ignition leads. He hurried to tear away the oilcloth and opened the bag, where he then got to see a copper string. When he exhausted all of his body's strength to pull the string, he could hear a sizzling sound coming out from the box and white smoke began to rise up, this was the sign of a successful ignition. To slow down the burning time, 
The lead wire was soaked in salt, only needing the time of 10 breaths to explode. When Vanner saw white smoke rising up from the box, his world turned quiet around him. He had already witnessed the power of this thing, if it exploded in his hands, he was afraid that not even any pieces of his own body would be left. Nine breaths. Vanner could hear his own heartbeat, as if it wanted to give him a countdown. Step by step, he went in front of the demonic beast, placing explosives under the beast. Five breaths. Now that it had built up so much pressure, nothing could stop the explosion now. Three breaths. Vanner turned and ran. Two breaths. Once breaths, he could only hear a muffled sound. Vanner felt the shockwave and the world became noisy again. He turned around and could see a lot of white blasted up from under the shell, that was the snow shot into the air from the explosives, at first glance it looked like a diffused misty flower. The demonic beast finally stopped, but before it fell, it crashed into the ground, as if it couldn't afford to hold up its heavy carapace any longer. Then, black blood surged out from under the carapace, soaking the ground around it. Oh 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 dash. Seeing this, the crowd suddenly burst out in cheers. Vanner fell down to the ground, only now discovering that his clothes were soaked with sweat. It was finally over. When everyone thought this, the sound of the horn resounded throughout Border Town again. Once more, a horde of demonic beasts was marching toward Border Town, trying to destroy it. Chapter 50, Wall of Flames. Do you feel better now? Anna patted Nana on her back to comfort her. Anna's stomach was also turned upside down, but in the end she was still able to swallow it down. When the wounded man was carried in, he was still conscious and was constantly repeating, help me, help me, seeing the expression of despair and begging within his eyes left the people around him feeling heartbroken. Seeing the man's intestines hanging outside from his belly, Nana couldn't hold back and threw up. Even so, she still insisted on treating him. After placing the intestines back into the belly of the patient, Nana laid her hands above the wound, closed her eyes and began to heal the patient's wounds. Ah, after the healing Nana let out an exhausted sigh, leaned against Anna's shoulder and whispered, Today was the first time that the horn was blown, do you think that his highness is alright? I do not know, Anna shook her head, she wanted to go over there to see the situation at the walls with her own eyes, afraid that Roland could be in trouble. She was even a little envious of Nightingale, her ability to act without being noticed was very convenient. At this moment, a booming sound could be heard from the direction of the wall and everyone could feel the earth slightly trembling. Brian jumped off from the bed he was sitting on and began walking somewhat restlessly through the room. Young man, you have to relax said Serpine, while calmly wiping his sword. A knight isn't allowed to lose his cool before he enters a battle, this will only make bad things worse. Moreover, this situation is still far from bad. I'm very sorry, sir, replied Brian, ashamed, I just thought that there had to be a desperate battle on the wall, but I'm here, wasting my time, so I find it difficult to feel at ease. After all, it is my duty to defend the town. Perhaps. Sir Pine shrugged his shoulders, but it's not your responsibility to guard the town. After you heard that his highness will canonize you as a knight after winter, you should first understand that the first principle of the knight is allegiance. Now, he needs you to protect Anna, so now your responsibility is here. You, when you put it like this, for a moment Brian hesitated but then he seated himself on the bed again. But soon they heard the horn blow a second time, it was even more rapid than the first time. It just felt like thunder would roll over everyone's heart. Serpine frowned. Anna exclaimed Nana, shocked. Serpine turned around and saw that the witch was running directly toward the door. Brian immediately went to catch up with her, placing himself in front of her. You said you want to guard the walls? Now is your time, said Anna in a calm and autocratic voice, as long as you follow me on my way to the wall, you will not be contradicting his royal highness command. Hearing this, Brian was really shocked, but he raised his head to look quizzically towards Serpine. What an amazing girl, thought the Baron, there was nothing wrong with what she said. In addition, his highness does not require her to stay in the medical school. He had also heard from Nana that Anna could summon flames. So if the current situation was really tight, letting a witch join the battle would maybe be the deciding factor in reversing the situation. Coming to this conclusion, he nodded, protect her well. Yes sir. Brian yelled loudly and suddenly felt his blood burning. Seeing the two leave, Nana asked, father, will you not go with them? My battle is here, at your side, my good girl, said the Baron with a smile, whether it be the demonic beasts or the devil himself, 
I will never let any of them hurt you. The distance between the medical center and the wall wasn't far, so Anna and Brian could trot all the way along the stone path toward the east wall. When the two were finally close enough to see the outline of the wall around the central watchtower, they saw that the situation has become very problematic. A great hole was opened within the wall. Roland was being shielded by his personal guards, but several people were still on their way down. A demonic beast shaped like a bear came sprinting towards the militia. It was unstoppable, and when it hit the soldiers stationed at the front they were all sent flying. When someone saw Anna with her strange attire running towards them the person yelled at her, Hey, it's dangerous here, you have to leave immediately. Anna turned a deaf ear towards him and went directly towards the hole instead. After the demonic beast had fought its way through the militia, it turned around and rushed towards Anna. Brian stepped beside Anna, ready to protect her. He lowered his body and slashed out with his sword, but the crazy demonic beast had no intention to dodge and hit the edge of the sword with its front legs. The sword was immediately sent flying, but at the same time, the momentum was so strong that the beast's front legs were cut open and were even broken. It rolled around on the ground, screaming and looking like a dehydrated fish that was struggling to breathe. No one dared to come near it because they were afraid of getting hit. However, Anna walked beside the demonic beast, put both of her hands on the ground, and suddenly the demonic beast burst into flames. The beast turned into a ball of coal. When flames suddenly erupted within the crowd, Roland saw that Anna personally had come. He was immediately bathed in cold sweat. I hadn't planned for you to show yourself like this, he had originally intended to let Nana lay down the groundwork. After most people had accepted the presence of a witch, he had planned to announce Anna's presence in public. However, now every previously made plan was destroyed, so he immediately turned and said, Don't worry about me, go and protect her. Anna must not be lost. She was an important figure in the industrial development of his town, so if she were injured it would bring an immeasurable loss. I know, said Nightingale, but please also pay attention to your own safety. Anna went to the front walls with the fracture. When Roland's guards saw the girl in strange clothes coming towards them, they immediately stepped aside and let her through. Now, she stood among the soldiers, and spread her arms wide to shield them. Sending vines of flame from her hands, she let them climb up the wall along the destroyed section. Everyone's mouths were gaping open when they saw this scene. They dared not to believe their eyes when they saw a wall of flames rising up and slowly filling the gap in the wall. This wasn't an illusion. All of the guards had to step back because of the high temperature. The surrounding snow was rapidly melting, and formed clouds of white mist which then rose up. The demonic beasts also feared the flames. They immediately fled to the sides, and only occasionally one or two of them would try to break through the wall of fire, but no demonic beasts could step through the wall of flames. Everyone get back on the walls. Roland loudly shouted, trying to grasp the opportunity, get back into the formation. Hunter squad, fire at will. Then, he himself grabbed Carter's gun, laid it on the wall, and began to shoot down the demonic beasts. Seeing the prince himself attack motivated all the people present. After all, in this age, seeing nobility or the royal family taking the lead role and fighting alongside the militia was seldom seen, so seeing this greatly enhanced the morale. The crowd began to chant the slogan, Guard Border Town, fight for the prince, while at the same time maintaining the line of the defense and holding their formation. The fighting continued until the sky began to get dark. Only then were all the demonic beasts in front of the wall killed. Slowly, the wall of flames began to disperse and Anna, totally exhausted, wiped the sweat off her forehead. Then, Roland saw an incredible scene. Roland's personal guards laid their fists on their heart, and bowed in the direction of Anna. Then the militia, as if they were infected by the mood of the guards, also gave their salute. Incredibly, no one shouted or cursed her with evil words, they only watched her silently. After the war, all of Border Town was quiet. Seeing a kind of incredible power which was never seen before for the first time was indeed terrifying, but this power was used in their favor. When seeing it used for the confrontation with their greatest enemies, their fear gradually disappeared, replaced by trust and gratitude. Roland's heart went crazy while walking towards Anna, but when he was by her side he found her totally pale. She was walking unsteadily, and was on the verge of collapsing. Are you okay? He worriedly asked her and held her by her shoulder. Anna saw the prince safe, gave him a forced smile, and then fell down in his arms. Second Saga, Months of the Demon. Chapter 51, Her Majesty the Queen. 
Sunlight fell through a narrow window into the room and was reflected as dark red stripes on the wall. There were only a few places within the kingdom where you could still see the sun, and the port of clear water was one of them. In this place, the months of the demons, with its cold wind and strong snowfall, only had a tiny bit of influence. With the exception that the Black Sail fleet couldn't leave the harbor, the entire city was still as busy as usual. The city governor and harbor master Garcia Wimbledon was sitting at her square table under the window, seriously studying the contents of a letter. Her gray hair was caught in the sunset and had a golden touch. Her face produced shadows from the light, adding definition to her facial features and giving her a unique charm full of heroic spirit. Ryan had been standing by her side for quite a while. Although she had already exceeded her usual time for reading a letter of this length, he still chose to wait quietly for a little longer, he didn't want to interrupt the silence. Eventually, Garcia sighed softly, put the letter down, and then told him, my father is dead. Hearing this, Ryan was startled, and he had to ask, what? My father, Ali Wimbledon, King of Grey Castle. She rarely repeated anything she said, he thought, because when he usually asked her again, she would merely look at him like he hadn't said anything. However, she really wasn't kidding, right? The king is really dead? Ryan opened his mouth, trying to say some comforting words, but in the end he just asked, how did he die? Fortunately, she didn't care about this, she was the daughter of the king, the governor of the port of clear water, and the commander of the black sail fleet, she didn't need anyone to comfort her. The letter says that my brother Gerald killed my father, but he was caught by the guards. He didn't commit suicide to escape punishment, so in the end he was put to trial by several ministers, there he was sentenced to death by beheading. That doesn't sound right, Ryan subconsciously couldn't believe it. Of course that isn't the truth, said Garcia, expressionless, it's true that my first brother is a relatively stupid man, but he isn't so foolish to go on a suicide mission. If no one led him in that direction, he would never do such a thing. Someone framed him, asked Ryan. Let me guess, the third princess closed her eyes and thought for a moment before she answered, someone probably put this detailed plan in order, and tempted Gerald by saying that they would help him, bringing people into my father's courtyard. This must have been arranged by someone in advance, including the eradication, exchange, and bribing of the guards. But those aren't areas where Gerald has his strong points since he is just too lazy to arrange something like this. The rest would be simple, it was only important to acquire a person who had Gerald's trust, but would still betray him in the end. Ryan could add nothing. After all, these were only guesses. What truly happened was not important, the important part was only the result. He believed that this was also the thought of the third princess. Sure enough, Garcia opened her eyes and continued, I am 90% sure that it wasn't the first prince, he was a person who only knew brute force. His brain is one big muscle so it was regular that he was fooled. Only, when saying this, her voice had some spunk, my second brother would be this cruel. You mean Timothy Wimbledon was the true culprit. Apart from him, who else would know so much about Gerald? Also after this matter, he is the person with the greatest gains while speaking, Garcia was unconsciously tapping her finger on the table, even a blind person can see this? But he was father's favorite, so he really didn't need to do this. Her Highness was truly angry, Ryan realized. Seeing the princess this heated up was truly rare. It seems that even though she had been complaining that her father was too eccentric, in the end she still didn't want to see her father dying like this. Ryan was able to understand this feeling, more or less. In a large family, the younger generation would always have such a feeling towards the master of the house, a mountain they would have to surpass, both revering and hating him. If she was right and this was truly planned by the second prince, then his actions could indeed be considered bloody and cruel. But he. Why would he do this? Because he was afraid of me, Garcia took a deep breath, trying to control her emotions, he is afraid of my black sail fleet. Realizing that Ryan wouldn't answer, she continued to explain, Timothy seems to have a spy in our city, which in itself isn't surprising, I myself also have arranged eyes and ears in Valencia. When he discovered the existence of my black sail fleet it became easy for him to imagine what I would do later. Valencia isn't able to support an army that is capable of facing my fleet. So, he came to the conclusion to use Gerald as bait to get what he wanted. So you mean, he wants an army? He wants the throne, said Garcia, with my father's death and now even Gerald's death, he has become the first heir. 
I am afraid that he will press the ministers to crown him as fast as possible. Only when he becomes Wimbledon 4 will he be able to mobilize all his vassals with their armies. As she said this she shook her head, however, as I have already said, as father's favorite son he really didn't need to do this. Wouldn't that be worse, asked Ryan, worried, if your second brother gets crowned, won't he declare the battle for the throne finished and call you and your siblings back? What will you do then? Garcia answered as if she felt it was completely beneath her dignity, this step would be too straightforward, just because he was our father's favorite son, it doesn't mean that he will have the support of the ministers, especially because of his move to kill the former king, although he pushed the murder on Gerald and may be able to fool the civilians, I estimate that it will take a long time until he will be able to grasp full authority in Grey Castle. So, she looked cunningly at Ryan and said, I have to change my plan a little, Ryan immediately fell on one knee and said, I'm willing to serve. Garcia stood up, walked to the window and spoke to Ryan with her back to him, the first thing he is bound to do after he claims the throne is to deal with me. However, his only possibility to pressure me is to command Joe Cole, the Duke of the Southern Territory. I estimate that the latter will use the King's mourning period to delay sending out his troops, that old fox has always been reluctant to do business where he would make a loss. At most he will summon his feudatories and send them out to surround Port of Clear Water. Garcia paused slightly and then spoke further, however, this move will give us unnecessary trouble, so we will set sail tomorrow. Sail? Your Highness, don't tell me you want to. Eagle City lies more inland and is almost undefended. We can reach the town of Clear Spring by using the tributary of the San Juan River, from there we will only need one day to arrive at Eagle City. After we seize Eagle City, the entire southern territory will be under my control. The situation, after Timothy claims the throne, will be different than what he thinks it will be. When Timothy wants to know the Duke's progress but discovers that the whole south is under my control, I really want to see his face. But, you also said that Wimbledon 3 just passed away, and following this dash. What, do I need to shed some tears first? Garcia turned around, the light of the sunset fell on her body and covered her with a red veil. Her face was hidden in the dark, only her eyes were reflected by the light. The emotion shown within her eyes was as solid as a boulder, Ryan thought. Even if she is angry or feeling regret, she will never show sorrow. Showing sorrow wouldn't be suitable for a king or queen. No, you don't need to do that, Ryan seriously said. Garcia nodded with satisfaction, go and tell the captain that I want to speak him. Since Timothy was unwilling to wait until the end of the five years, I will not let him down. After I conquer Eagle City, I will declare the independence of the Southern Territory. All this didn't matter to himself, he thought, Garcia will always find a solution for every possibility. Once she decides on a path for herself, she will walk down the path courageously. This was where her charm laid and was one of the reasons why he followed her. Yes, your highness, no, Ryan corrected himself, your majesty. Chapter 52, Heart of Fire, Part 1. Roland knocked on the door, and when he heard Nightingale's response he entered the room. The windows in the room were closed and had thick curtains. They were only open during the early morning and evening to let in fresh air. At any other time the windows were closed to keep the room warm. The only light in the room came from two candles at the end of the bed. The candles burned quietly and threw out many crisscrossing shadows throughout the room. Roland went towards the bed. Seeing that the woman resting on the soft pillows and bedding still had her eyes closed, he sighed softly. Is Border Town's defense still holding, asked Nightingale while coming over to Roland and handing him a cup of tea. At the moment everything is going smoothly, answered Roland while taking a small sip, but then he gave her the cup back, from that day on, a big group of demonic beasts like last time hasn't attacked us. Also, all of our injured members of the militia are now healed and back, ready to fight. Their fighting passion has become, somewhat high, what is with the damaged part of the city wall. Carl rolled logs under the carapace of the mixed beast to move it towards the hole in the wall. There, he will use a capstan to get it up and use a wooden frame to hold it upright, making it a part of the city wall, Roland knew that Nightingale was trying to distract him by questioning him, so that he wouldn't worry himself too much. However, when he stepped into the room, all his attention would always stay on the woman who was lying in bed. If we say that the last time we confronted the large-scale invasion we obtained a victory worthy of pride, there is no doubt that the biggest contributor for the victory was Anna. If she hadn't used her wall of flames to block the gap in the wall, 
the consequences would really have been unthinkable. However, she hadn't woken up since she fainted in his arms. It has already been one week, whispered Roland. Theoretically, if a person laid in a coma for one week without food or water, with no possibility of supplying her with nutrition through external measures such as injection, the body's functions will shut down and the brain will gradually go into shock and die. However, Anna did not have any signs of poor health, in fact her appearance now was better than when she fell into Roland's arms. Her cheeks were rosy, her breathing was smooth, and when Roland put his hand on her forehead he could feel that she had a normal temperature. Everything showed that Anna was at full health, but, she wouldn't wake up. This is also the first time I have encountered such a situation, Nightingale stood at Roland's side, shaking her head while explaining, she depleted all her magic within her body, but now her magic power is already at the point of saturation, even more rich than it has been in the past. If I did not calculate it wrong, today at midnight will be her day of adulthood. Do you mean she's going to be an adult while in a coma? No, she will die while in a coma, Nightingale said bluntly, you must use your will to overcome the suffering on your day of adulthood. If your resistance is broken, the bite of the witch's magic power will irreversibly destroy her body. Roland moved a chair next to the bed and sat down, I remember that you once said that when facing magic backslash, no matter how painful it becomes, you will always stay conscious and clear-headed. Either you will be able to cross this hurdle or you will choose to terminate your life. Indeed, it is exactly like this. Within the Witch Cooperation Association we also had someone who believed to draw support from being unconscious when passing through the bite of the evil spirit, only having to bear the torment once a year, Nightingale hesitated but then continued. She said that she relied on alchemic substances to sleep, but in the end it was meaningless, when the moment came she was immediately devoured by the magic without any chance to resist. The pain does not slowly increase. No, when your time arrives, the pain will strike you just like lightning, but how long you have to resist varies from person to person. My sister was not strong enough, but, she trailed off. Roland understood what she meant, not knowing how long they had to suffer the pain was already a kind of torture in itself, not knowing how long they have to resist, it was similar to being on an abandoned ship in the middle of a heavy storm. It would be easy to let people give up the desire to live on. During the moment of silence, Roland felt a hand on his shoulder. During my homeless and miserable years, I had seen too much death. I saw witches being treated like cattle, hanged, burned, or tortured to death just for the entertainment of the nobility. The only way for a witch to survive was to live far away from other humans, living a cloistered life. I do not know where the holy mountain is located, but in our hearts it is an unattainable paradise. Nightingale's voice became softer than it had ever been in the past. But Anna is different. In addition to the help we sisters can give her, I have never seen someone else being so concerned about a witch as you. She is needed by people, she is valued and treated like a normal person. Your Highness, Anna has not even made it through her adulthood yet, but she has already found her holy mountain. However, this was not the outcome Roland had hoped for. He closed his eyes, and recalled the scene when he had met her. She was barefoot, and was only wearing tattered clothes. She had been living in a cage, but there was not the slightest hint of fear in her face. Her eyes resembled an unpolluted lake surface, clear and calm. She was the flame, but she wasn't flickering like a flame. Memories began to appear like the pictures on a film reel. I have satisfied your curiosity, sir, so can you kill me now? I have never used my power to hurt someone else. I just want to stay near you, your highness, nothing more. The demon's bite will never kill me, I will beat it. Are you dreaming? I'm not going anywhere. Roland had to restrain his surging thoughts and whispered, I will stay here and accompany her until the last moment. I will also stay, thank you. After dinner, when Nana heard that Anna would go through her day of adulthood, she insisted on staying. Roland set aside a room for her and her father who would accompany her during the night. Like this, Roland and the two witches were sitting besides the bed, quietly waiting for the approaching midnight hour. Regarding Nightingale and Nana, they would also have to face the demon's bite this winter, but fortunately their magic awakened on different days. Otherwise, the three witches would have to suffer their test of life and death at the same time. Roland estimated that if that was the case he wouldn't be able to stay calm in the room. The town had no clock tower, so with only the light of the candles, the passage of time became blurred. Cold wind blew against the window, so from time to time they could hear the screeching wind. When Roland felt a trace of weariness attack his heart, 
Nightingale suddenly said, it has begun. Only she could see the magic flow within Anna's body, she saw that it became restless, and the cluster of green flame became unusually rich, but the white incandescence in her center turned dark, while all of the irritable magic converged inward. It seemed to be pulled towards the center while struggling and rolling wildly, but it was of no use. Roland couldn't see these changes, but he was also aware that something was wrong. The candle flames began to shake, even though no wind was blowing inside the room. The light emitted by the flames got darker, it seemed like all the shadows were swallowed by the flame as it changed its color, the orange-red glow turned into a jade-like green flame. He looked at the woman lying on the bed, but she was still sleeping, without even the slightest changes on her face, as if all this had nothing to do with her. At this point the flame of the candles almost disappeared, but the flame was not extinguished. The green flames were just like phagocytic cells eating up the orange flames, plunging everything into darkness. But soon, the fire was lit up again. However, this time the flame of the candles had turned into a pure green. The three people sitting around the bed were submerged in green light, looking quizzically into each other's eyes, but in the end no one could understand what was happening. However, at this moment, everyone's eyes turned towards the bed, they had heard Anna groaning. Anna slowly opened her eyes. Anna, Roland was shocked, she woke up. Anna blinked a few times to clear her eyes, but then she smiled at him stretching out with the open palm of her right hand, reaching for the prince. A massive green fire was leaping up from her palm, quietly burning. Roland didn't know why, but he could understand what Anna wanted. He hesitated for only a moment, but then he slowly inserted a finger into the flame. The anticipated burning sensation didn't come. Instead, it was just like being wrapped up in lukewarm water, it felt soft and warm. Chapter 53, Heart of Fire, Part 2 the day after Anna woke up, Roland and the others bid Nightingale farewell. Although the reason why is still unclear, but Anna is probably the first witch who has spent the day of awakening without pain, Nightingale excitedly said before leaving. After Nightingale had followed Roland for a long time, she got used to the term awakening when describing the transformation of witch. When I come back, I will bring my sisters with me. At that time I hope you will accept us, just as you had accepted Anna. This would be exactly what Roland wished for. With only Anna's ability he was able to revolutionize the forging process, allowing the town to see the dawn of the industrial age, so what would he be able to do with a bunch of witches? Of course, he also had to take into account safety issues, since crossing the mountains during the months of the demons was very dangerous. But apparently, Nightingale was quite eager to bring her sisters back because she said, during this winter, many of my sisters will have to face this difficult period. If I can bring them the news only a little earlier, I might be able to save at least some of my sisters. Rest assured, normally the demonic beasts aren't able to find my whereabouts. Finally, Roland asked, when do you have to face your day of awakening? Nightingale turned around and mounted her horse, at the end of winter or early spring. While leaving, Nightingale waved back towards the prince, do not worry about me, in the previous years the bite of the demons gotten lighter and lighter for me. This answer gave Roland something to think about. He had already thought about how Anna could survive her day of awakening. After all, Anna said afterwards that she hadn't felt any pain. This was completely against the Nightingale's concept, the power of witches come from the devil, so the power is contaminated by evil. This could be seen when their blood turned black and flowed out of every pore. Their skin would look burnt, leaving the body in a miserable condition. This was unshakable and irrefutable evidence. However, since the beginning, Roland had thought this was wrong. He rummaged through the memories of the old fourth prince, but he didn't find any proof that God or the devil existed in this world. Since it isn't a divine power, it shouldn't be regarded as a standard to distinguish between good and evil. In fact, even if there were gods who would frequently interfere with the mortal world, it was still the believers who choose their own camp. Only then would the gods get their power, rather than vice versa. According to the Nightingale's description, a witch would gather the magic gathering within her body. However, when the magic had no way to be released, would it damage its own vessel? Roland thought that the possibility of this theory being right was very high. After all, most people who were confronted with hostility and pressure would certainly choose to hide their own abilities, pretending to be normal while hoping to leave the battlefield alive. This would lead to the point where before they reached their adulthood they would rarely have the opportunity to use their magic. Roland certainly did not think that his castle would block the demon's bite. 
He asked Anna if she had an unbearably painful experience before this. If anything was different during this year, then it was because she came to the castle and was able to use her magic almost every day. So, with Nightingale's final answer his guess was confirmed, her stealth ability wasn't very noticeable, so she could even use it often. In addition, she had been forced into training her ability by other people and was forced to use her ability recklessly. Thus, the backfire of her magic power only had little impact on her. When Roland were back in the castle he immediately started Nana's enhanced training. If no one was injured while defending the town, she had to treat a variety of small animals. If he was able to confirm his theory with Nana's help, the significance for the witch community could be described as earth-shaking. The devil's curse would change into a present of the divine. As long as he could ensure that his territory was a safe haven for witches, endless masses of witches would come to border town. He didn't know how, but after the last attack everything was back on track, without any big waves. Roland began to intensify the production of his steam engine too, but also gave Anna enough time to get familiar with her new capabilities. He built another shack in his backyard, but this time it was cover from the snow. It was used as an experimental area, since he still felt it was safer to build one in his own backyard. Nightingale had previously said that witches, when reaching adulthood, would stabilize their magic power and probably produce new branch capabilities. However, until now he hadn't seen Anna show any new capabilities, but her control of fire, had become completely differently than before. No, whether or not it could be called a flame was still a question. Roland thought, the former flame was still in the range to understand with common sense, but now the green flame wasn't understandable with common sense. He named it Heart of Fire. It could exist away from Anna but at the same time stay influenced by Anna's will, capable of changing its shape. Just as she was doing it right now, the heart of fire was burning on top of an iron panel two yards away from her, swaying lightly back and forth, as if it was saluting her. However, Roland knew that Anna was still controlling it. Normally, the heart of fire had a temperature close to one's body temperature, but when Anna wanted to heat it up, it would instantly raise its temperature to a comparatively higher temperature changing its color from a jade-like green into darker green. Similarly, it could also turn into a big cluster of flames from a small flame, or even change its movement speed. Unfortunately, it couldn't be moved too far away from Anna. After repeated testing they discovered that when the flame moved more than 5 yards away from Anna, it would disappear. Another new feature of the Heart of Flame was that Anna could call more than one flame, but until now she had barely been able to operate the two flames simultaneously. Even so, the situation at the wall was described as calm. The demonic beasts would still appear one after another outside the wall, but there was no presence of a mixed species. Without them it was nearly impossible for the demonic beasts to break through. Just like Roland had said, they became stronger and faster, but they were still just beasts. Due to the huge wall length, they had to direct the demonic beasts to the middle section of the wall, so that the militia with only 200 members could hold the wall. So in addition to his daily routine of patrolling his territory, Roland had plenty of time to spend on construction. He had set aside a site south of the castle, and planned to use it as living area for the arriving witches. As the investor of the project, he appointed Carl as the head of the workers, building a batch of two-story brick houses. At the same time, a reasonable and beautiful layout was considered, allowing easy entrance and exit, and a good drainage system strove to create a well-planned neighborhood. He also considered whether the witches would be distributed to the old areas or only the new urban areas, mixing them with the common inhabitants, but after thinking about it, he gave up the plan. Although this would help accelerate the acceptance of the witches by the normal people, before he could erase all the misunderstandings, the consequences were likely irreparable. After all, the witches only had a certain influence within the militia. In addition, there was also no guarantee that the witches brought by Nightingale were harmless and behaved people, most of them had suffered the pain and suffering of the world, so Roland was afraid that the situation wouldn't be so easy to summarize. After all, all the witches couldn't be like Anna and Nana. Also, when the witches lived in one area it would be convenient for collective management. Before they came, Roland had to draw up all the relevant rules and regulations. Until now, Roland had no experience he could refer to, after all, he had neither the personnel nor capacity of the National Security Agency, nor was he the creator of the Avengers, who knew how to manage a group of people and had the abilities for it. 
he was without any better option than to press for a basic system used for personnel management by companies, slowly wading through the river by groping for stones. Of course, Roland knew that this program had loopholes, but as a pioneer, what else could he do? Retracing his tail and only staying in border town could take decades to be able to touch the threshold of industrialization, but he wasn't a cultivator, so how could he wait for decades? Wanting to lead this era into the next, being at the forefront of the reform, it was necessary to have a spirit of adventure. Just when he was recording these thoughts on paper, Varav opened the door and walked in. Shaking the snow of his coat and saluting the prince, he informed him, Your Highness, a messenger of Longsong stronghold is coming. Chapter 54, Bad News. Petrov didn't think that he would visit border town again so soon. He had not intended to travel during the cold winter. In particular, he had not intended to leave his warm house when the demonic beasts were ravaging the countryside. However, when Duke Ryan personally gave him the mission to deliver this letter with hot news to the hands of the fourth prince, he had no way to refuse. He certainly knew the contents of the letter, in fact, the entire aristocracy in the kingdom of Greycastle were discussing the amazing news, the king of Greycastle had fallen because of murder committed by his eldest son, Gerald Wimbledon. Immediately after the news spread, the second prince stepped forward, announcing that the kingdom could not survive without a king. Since he was previously the second in line, he was now the heir and with this would then be the next king. However, this behavior wasn't approved by everyone. It was said that the process of Gerald's trial was very strange, because during the whole interrogation, the prince was only seen a few times, but he hadn't said a single word and his hands were tied tightly. So, most ministers were hoping to look into the matter thoroughly before deciding who would inherit the throne. It was also rumored that the second son Timothy Wimbledon played a self-guided drama, where he was the real killer and was only placating a sad look, but in truth couldn't wait to inherit the throne. In the end, the debate about the true culprit was meaningless. Since the second prince had the full support of the imperial prime minister, he could temporarily take over the position of king, so he was still able to grasp the right to be the supreme ruler of Grey Castle. At the same time he took over the throne, he issued an order to recall all of his competitors, the battle for the throne was over, so the king's sons and daughters should return to Grey Castle before the end of the winter after receiving the prince's edict. Based on the ruling of their conferred territories during the last six months, the new king would then be officially canonized. Petrov could clearly detect the urgent mood within the letter. Through this, Timothy Wimbledon could firmly secure the throne. Everything depended on the reaction of the king's other children. If they behaved and gave up the fight for the throne, and returned to Grey Castle, Timothy would naturally become the undisputed Wimbledon IV. All documents sent to Border Town would be transferred through Longsong Stronghold first. When Duke Ryan saw the recall order, his first reaction was to snort disdainfully. The former king was always fair towards the nobles, and gave them lots of freedom, but as for the second prince, his ascension to the throne by force would need to be incomparably harsh. This could be seen when Gerald was sentenced to death by the guillotine, so now, no one would go back to Grey Castle, fearing to get the same treatment. However, in the eyes of the six families of the Longsong stronghold, this was a well-timed command. Two months ago, Earl Elk set an unauthorized plan into action and made Duke Ryan very unhappy, especially since the plan failed. The prince's reaction was very intense, sentencing Dimitri Hill to death by hanging. With this, both sides could be regarded as having a public and acrimonious conflict. Duke Ryan had originally intended to wait until the end of the months of the demons so that he would have a free hand to solve the awful problem, but now he had this document. With this, he had a legal option. Roland Wimbledon was called back by the soon-to-be king, so when he left, Border Town would naturally be owned by Duke Ryan again. However, if he didn't go back to Grey Castle, Duke Ryan would be able to send him back by force, everything under the name of the new king's banner. In the end, the duke didn't care which hands the crown would fall to. Thinking of his return to Border Town, Ambassador Petrov naturally didn't feel very comfortable. Last time, he had vowed that by his next visit he would bring a new trade agreement, but in the end the result was that they were attacked by the Elk family. Now he was back, bringing bad news once more, whether it was the death of his father Wimbledon III, the new king, or the recall order, Petrov believed that the fourth prince didn't want to see any of them. Since the kingdom of Grey Castle laid in the south of the continent, the way to border town was smooth sailing because even in winter, the river didn't freeze. 
From time to time, Petrov went to the window and took a look outside. During the journey he didn't see any person dead, starving, or even fleeing, which indicated that border town had yet to fall. This made him a little surprised. After all, the last time he had visited, he had seen that the wall had yet to be built. Petrov didn't have much confidence in them since they were building a stone wall out of mud. Then, an even more surprising situation appeared. He saw a boat with the banner of Willow Town hanging on its mast slowly passing them on the right side of the river. This would usually be a familiar scene, but not during the months of the demons. Even when Border Town was fighting with the demonic beasts they were still able to do business. Without transferring all of their mining workers towards defending, how could they withstand the brutal attacks of the monsters? Three days later, Petrov's vessel arrived at Border Town's pier. It was still the same dilapidated wooden dock, but now at its end was wooden shed. After the ship docked, two guards emerged from the shed, staring at the boatman's every move. Petrov immediately understood what Roland intended with this arrangement. Obviously, the fourth prince didn't want anyone to secretly leave the town by the river. After identification by the guards, someone immediately brought him a horse and then took him to the castle while accompanied by guards.